John Aston, welcome to the show. Thanks for having me. It's great to be here. Man, it's crazy how we kind of got to know each other. I, I'd seen your uh, interview on, or listened to your interview on Sam Harris's Waking Up app. Mm -hmm. And I was like, this guy, who is this guy? He's pointing directly at reality. He's saying, oh, you know, reality you thought was one way, but when you actually look at it, mm -hmm. it's not that way. And that got me quite interested because I'm quite interested in this stuff. And then I started listening to your guided meditations and I read about half of your book, um, The Extraordinary Moment, and was hooked. So I'm so happy that we can talk about all the oh, things. I'm thrilled to be here. Man, yeah. so I listen, for people who don't, maybe we'll just start at the beginning. You are a, a health psychologist, right? Mm -hmm. By I, training. Yeah, I, I have a PhD in health psychology back in the late 90s, I got that PhD. And I got sort of married together my interest in contemplative practice many years ago, my involvement with meditation at the time with my kind of scholarly pursuits. Mm -hmm. And so health psychology was a discipline that sort of fit nicely with that interest in marrying those two things together because it's looking at mind-body relationships and how could doing something like meditation have potential implications and benefits for our health. So it just seemed like, okay, this is a place where I can pull those interests together in a very natural way. That's how I ended up in health psychology. And and does a health psychologist actually, do you see clients, do you have patients or do you teach, is it academic? Um, I'm teaching now, I don't, um, I don't have a private like clinical practice. I'm not a licensed psychologist. Um, so most of my work in health psychology initially was research after I got my degree, uh, studying meditation and sort of health applications. And then over the last eight, nine years, I got into teaching. Uh, university teaching, and uh, it is my true love. I absolutely love teaching. It's just, I'm so um, grateful I get to do what I do. I love and, teaching. And you haven't been canceled by the students yet? That has not occurred. <laughs> yet. They seem They seem to, um, th th I'm still there. That's good. That. No, Because no, no. you're, you're definitely a free thinker, so that means you're in danger, so be careful. Potentially. Yeah. yeah. I, the, the, the territory that I cover with them doesn't tend to venture into some of the more socially controversial areas of life where I could bump up against that risk more. Um, right. We'll do that <laughs> on future shows. Yeah, yeah, yeah maybe on <laughs> another show. But no, I mean, I, I'm lucky enough somehow, I, I, I joke that I use the discipline of psychology as like a Trojan horse of sorts mm. to sort of smuggle in this um, more wild stuff that I'm very passionate about talking about in terms of the nature of reality. But I, it, it's not a big leap to do that because the stuff that we'll be chatting about, you know, my book and that you came across in my interview with Sam is very relevant, needless to say, to psychology and the things that people struggle with in their lives and their psychological lives. So. It's a kind of crazy Trojan horse because when I heard some of your story and you can fill us in, like you started out like back in the day, I mean, you went to Berkeley initially. Initially, uh, dropped out. Okay, oh, so you got me beat. Yeah, I graduated in three years, bro. You dropped out. I dropped okay? out. It's a competition, and guess who? <laughs> guess who lost? Me. <laughs> well, I, I was wanting to to learn about things like the nature of reality and these kind of Eastern meditative traditions that suddenly were coming into my life, and I couldn't learn about those at Berkeley at the time. I was like, "Why am I in school? I want to study these other things. I need to leave school for now." And uh, I did that. But then, then when back. I went back to college, I didn't go to Berkeley. I finished back east at a small school and. Um, Hampshire College. And when I went back, um, I just said, I'm bringing this interest in the whole world of contemplation and the nature of mind and consciousness into the academy. Somehow I'm going to make that happen. And as an undergrad, I I wrote a um, my like senior thesis, which is this huge project. It was longer than my dissertation, my doctoral <laughs> dissertation. I, I was looking at kind of the applications of yoga philosophy in psychology and was drawing a lot of Ken Wilber's work at the time. And yeah. Yeah, so. I'm, a, I'm a fan of Ken's. Yeah. Uh, wow, so what, what, was it, what was it in your life, in your youth that kind of cracked the door for this? Because mm. people don't just suddenly, I mean, I know it might've been the 60s and stuff, uh, but people don't just go, oh, I'm gonna do this. Like, Not for me, because I'm a little too young for the, the kind of you know late 60s sort of consciousness explosion. I was right. still 10 years old at the time. You weren't um, meditating 12 hours a day at age 10? No. What kind of 60s kid are you? <laughs> yeah, <right. laughs> yeah, yeah. Now, I, you know, I think it was, um, I think there were two, 
primary things. I had a very, very close friend, like one of my closest friends in the world. And he was going to school in Southern California. I was up in Northern California. And this was back in the day where we were writing letters to each other. Oh, those Pre-email. Days. Oh, wow. And he was writing me these long letters about these experiences he was having, you know, out-of-body body experiences, altered states of consciousness that sort of happened upon him unexpectedly. And um, I got very curious about that. And then simultaneously, I had been very involved in political action work on the campus at the time. And there was a young woman involved with that work. And I was finding myself uh, troubled by a lot of what I was seeing in the activism, where Mm. it felt to me like they were, in many respects, like wanting to create this world of harmony and cooperation and love and peace um, and social justice. And yet the way they actually were showing up with each other and talking to one another and talking about the enemy that was against those things was, was sort of um, the antithesis of what they were supposedly endeavoring to create in the world in terms of their anger and their hostility and their lack of awareness and consciousness. So I was like, what? This just seems off to me somehow. So I asked this friend of mine who was involved in this political action work with me I said, what's up with that? It feels like so hypocritical somehow. The way they were not embodying what it was. What's the saying? You know, be the change you want to see in the world. Right. They were not being the change they wanted to see in the world. Anything but that. But I I was confused by that. I was 19 years old. And something felt off to me about it. And this friend of mine said, they don't realize something very fundamental, John, which is the real transformation is the transformation of you. Ah, transformation of you and when she said those words it went off like a bomb inside my wow mind. And i was like i had never considered that 19 years old i, I and it, it certainly played a huge role in setting me on some sort of path of self-exploration exploration of life and reality Man, you know, it's funny, that makes me think of uh, Nisargadatta, who's an Indian sage, and he has in his book, uh, I Am That, there's a conversation he has that I I actually did a video on this um, with a young activist of that era Mm. who says, you know, the world is a mess. How can you sit there and and say this and this and this? And he says, shh, he's like, forget the reforms and mind the reformer. Mm -hmm. You are the world, so why are you not looking here first? And it's a very powerful pointer. So you saw that kind of, Back then. It definitely was a catalyst for setting me on a path of, yeah, a path of self-exploration. And um, yeah, it really wasn't coming out of, as I think it often is for people, of a sense of that I was suffering somehow. And then I was looking for some solution to my suffering. It certainly, that is certainly a catalyst, obviously, for many people um, to start to seek for something else, right? Yeah. Um, To help them with that. And, but in my case, it was just more this sort of curiosity that kind of came out of nowhere and the next thing I knew, people were, if I was getting books handed to me of, you know, Herman Hess and Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. And I was like, didn't know who these people were. And and I'm reading about meditation. And then somebody gave me a copy of Yogananda's book, Autobiography of a Yogi. And I was completely transfixed by that book. And it was like I'm reading, I had done just a wee bit of drug experimentation over the course of about a year at that time. And some doors of perception certainly opened up to reveal that the world was much more than I imagined it to be. There was much more going on, it seemed, based on these experiences. So that sort of deepened my curiosity. Mm. And um, so then I'm, you know, reading this book by Yogananda where he's talking about, you know, these other realms and worlds. And I was just like very taken by that. So got involved in very involved in his teaching for for a number of years. Yogananda, and it, it's yeah. funny how that experience with psychedelics is just, it's almost just a glimpse of, hey, you know, there are different ways that the mind can be. Mm-hmm. And uh, it's enough to shake you out of a kind of a, I don't know if the word is delusion, it's almost mm-hmm. like you're stuck in a certain conceptual realm yeah. and the psychedelics just control alt delete that realm yeah. <laughs> and yeah. you reboot. I think, I think that, I don't think we really understand exactly the mechanisms yet. I mean, you know, you're you're a science lover, and I'm sure I've looked into that particular question as well. Um, yeah, I don't think we really understand how they might be having the kind of impact that they have. But it is rather interesting, like in my field of psychology, and I'm starting to talk to my students about this. Hmm. And I say, I'm because I'm introducing this kind of non-dual perspective very gently, but 
also very radically in a way at the same time. To, to graduate students? Oh yeah, in psychology, training to be therapist. Wow. And I've been talking recently about the research in psychedelic assisted therapy, which is really quite compelling. Like it really seems like it's benefiting people um, who have been struggling with mental health issues for, for, for years in some cases. And I said, I'm not a, necessarily a proponent of psychedelic use. I don't use it myself. I haven't for decades. Um, but here's, here's what I'm interested in is not the drugs themselves, but the experiences that they seem to be eliciting, mm. which kind of, if you look at some of the research, center around two kind of themes. One is self-transcendence mm. and the other is awe and wonder. Mm. And those are obviously very connected, those two things. And it seems like from some of like some of the qualitative research that something about having these experiences in the context of their therapeutic work is playing some significant role in transforming the way they see themselves and their experience and their mental health issues. And yeah, you're like opening up. I mean, if you think about if you if you're seeing the world, let's say through a very maybe depressogenic kind of lens and the world feels meaningless or hopeless or uh, or I'm a complete failure and I'm worthless, right? So these are all, of course, interpretations of the world. It's a lens, it's a perspective. Um, and then suddenly, whether one aspect of the drugs is like softening the perspectives, possibly quieting them to the point where they're not operating really very much at all. Now you're seeing the world sort of outside of those frames of reference. And then you're sort of dunked into this discovering the absolutely astonishing nature of the most seemingly insignificant phenomena, which are astonishing and awe-inspiring if we look the right way. And somehow the drugs seem to kind of help people in certain cases to, to sort of stop overlooking, you could say, the significance of everything, the, the, the <laughs> absolute value intrinsic in everything, then you can imagine how that would shift your view of your depressogenic view of life, right? Suddenly you're just, do you know what I mean? It's like, it's, I'm, I'm curious about this because, and I was talking to a colleague about this. She said, I actually think this research in psychedelics, maybe most importantly, is pointing people like in the direction of the kind of work that I'm exploring in yes. terms of opening up these, this perspective on experience that's out beyond our frames of reference, our, our conceptual frames of reference and how, intrinsically transformative and therapeutic, you could say that actually is for human beings. So maybe that research is going to potentially in some way, I'm just gonna be sort of tracking it from afar because I'm not doing that research, but it might be actually highlighting why, like I'm telling my students, it's like, why am I teaching you this stuff that's in my book and that, I, you know, that I'm sharing with people about exploring reality because it's reality is actually 180 degrees different than you think it is <laughs> and then some, you know, and that has seeing that has just untold benefits. I think that's the simplest way to put it. Uh, okay. So there's so much here, by the yeah. way, I'm gonna grab your book real quick and yeah, show yeah. people this book. So this is the book we'll, we'll show it at the end too. And throughout, um, you have quite a few books, but this one is the latest and it's quite good. Mm -hmm. Um, okay. So this idea that, and, and I think this is, this points to my own experience in college mm -hmm. because I had that smattering of experiences too. Mm -hmm. And it it is it is as if all the all your life you've been living in a world that you think is this way. Mm -hmm. Meaning the world of concepts, the world of labels, the world of okay, this is a table, that's a John Aston, this is a room, I'm mm -hmm. supposed to get a job, I'm gonna be a doctor, this, that, the other thing. And then suddenly you take this thing and all of that kind of is kind of there. Mm -hmm. It kind of floats back and mm -hmm. then you see what's actually here in front of you. And it is right. the what you think is the most mundane thing because your labels are mundane. <laughs> they can't capture it. Mm -hmm. Suddenly the label drops off and you're just seeing experience as it is, right. radiant, alive, infinite, indescribable, inconceivable, mm -hmm. and coming out of absolutely nothing totally impermanent. And again, there's almost, a, 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 there's an emotional quality to it that arises, which is a kind of an infinite unconditional love that comes with that mm -hmm. sometimes. And those those drugs can point you at that. Mm -hmm. Then when you come back, you're like, what was I worried about again? Like what, right. <laughs> this depressed mood of mine is another radiant zero distance intimate experience that we're calling 
depressed mood. But in reality, if I actually look at it, if I actually experience it as the energy pattern or pattern of the, I can't, what words are there? Right. And, th and that seems to me that's the heart of your work. When I listen to mm -hmm. your interview with Sam, and you talked about your history, you work with Kabat-Zinn doing mm -hmm. research early on on mindfulness and mm -hmm. looking at the science of meditation and how it can help people through a health psychology lens. And that was all wonderful. And then something kind of mm -hmm. clicked at some point for you, yeah? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I was very, you know, a uh, very dedicated, well, semi-dedicated meditator. I struggled with meditation. It's hard. The discipline of it. I, yeah. I didn't enjoy it um, in some respects, but I had a belief that in order to get to where I wanted, thought I wanted to get in terms of my unfolding as, as a human spiritual seeker, uh, if you will, that meditation, that was it. That, that was what I needed to do. So I was doing it with that in mind. And then um, basically, I don't know, I guess 20 years ago or so, uh, I was on a retreat and during a period of meditation where we were doing a very sort of non-doing style of meditation, just allowing experience to be as it is, there was just this discovery that, that the idea that I had to do something to bring about what it was I was looking for just completely fell apart and... It was like the absolute, you know, radiant brilliance of reality, which is always shining as every instant, was just that much more apparent. And of course, that's what I was. So I wasn't like somehow sitting over here looking at that radiance, looking at the existence itself, the beingness of life. I, of course, was that. And so that was a sort of a shocking thing to discover when you'd spent... I'd spent the better part of a couple of decades imagining that I was anything but that, which is why I was looking so earnestly for it, right? And so that was a, yeah, that was a mind-blowing thing to kind of see that, a bit bittersweet too, because I'd been, you know, it's like imagining, there you are, you're sitting in your house, you know, and you're like looking for home, you know? It's like, when am I gonna get home? When am I gonna get home? And then, you know, life hits you over the head somehow, which is what it kind of felt like and said, mm. you are home. I mean, this is home. Everything is home. Every moment is home. It's like, oh my God. It's like, what have I been doing? Working so hard to get home, to arrive at home. And um, so that was, of course, you know, I could never quite approach meditation in the same way after that. You know, mildly. <laughs> that's, a, that's such a beautiful story. And, and what's, so, I mean, I've had those experiences where, mm. It's a non-doing, yeah. everything stops, and it's just the radiant aliveness of this moment. And it, mm -hmm. and there, there are qualities, again, to talk about it is almost doing it violence because the, it starts to conceptualize an experience that's not mm -hmm. even an experience. You are the radiant aliveness of this moment. It's perfect. Mm -hmm. It's happening by itself to no one. Mm -hmm. And there's an immediate recognition. <laughs> and I, I, that's why when you talked about this, it, mm -hmm. it just hit home. There's an immediate recognition that there, all the doing, all the striving, all the seeking that everyone's looking for, mm -hmm. it's always been right here. But the paradox is, how did I get to right here? I had to hurt myself <laughs> in meditation and then finally relax almost to surrender and then it just happens. Yeah, I, 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 I uh, wrote something in a few books ago, like something to the effect of, we overlook the miracle that lies before us for the simple reason that we keep looking for it somewhere else. So uh -huh. we're, right? I mean, mm -hmm. this is the miracle. Yeah. This is walking on water. Like, this is the miracle of how, how is anything here? I mean, really, how is anything here? There's no answer to that question. So we're, we're sitting immersed in and we are the very miracle the miracle of miracles. And of course, that's always the case. And you know, when I was just mentioning psychedelics, not, not to like trip out on psychedelics, um, <laughs> uh, again, it's, it's about what is being opened up. That's the most important thing, I think, for, for some people. And, and you know, it's almost like I say to my grad students sometimes when I start to talk about this, I do a class on awe and wonder in one of the classes. You do a whole I, class I don't, on I don't wonder? do a whole quarter on it, but I spend a whole evening discussing it. Wow. And um, it's actually a topic that's been studied in the last decade or so in psychology. It's right. really fascinating. Haidt has written about it too. Yeah, in fact, he did some of the early work. John, ah, John, interesting, John yeah. Haidt, yeah. And um, I say that, you know, it's like a joke of the person that's tripping, you know, 
where they're just like you know, looking at the bubbles in their root beer, you know, and just tripping out on that for like 30 minutes. Like, wow, you know, it's so cool. And it's like, but we could laugh about that, but what's going on there? Like what, what's happening there? And I, and I say, I can attest to this, that without the aid of any mind altering substance, just look at those bubbles, just start to notice how much is actually there, how astonishing the entire display is of what, what you're looking at, the light that's there, the, 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 the crystalline structures, the, I mean, on and on and on. You're just, that's the rabbit hole of infinity that you're looking at. You're looking at infinity. You're only ever looking at infinity. So, because everything is made of that, whatever anything is made of or everything is made of is, you know, pure mystery, right? It's pure mystery at the level of physics and it's pure mystery at the level of what we could say subjective experience. So interesting kind of parallel there. But to just, what are we tending to do when we look at everyday phenomena? Like I'm looking at the the desk, the texture of the desk that we're we're sitting at and talking, talking on. And you know, just like just you can just start like looking at the texture, just looking at what's there, because the tendency of the perceiving faculties with their heavy-handed interpreting that goes on is that, and most of us are just not even aware of this, that we're essentially discounting the significance of what's being perceived at some level, right? We're writing it off as what you could say like noise in the system. It's really the particular desk that we're sitting at and the color of it and the texture of it and the patterns in it. Who cares? I mean, how relevant is that to the the, the bigger narrative here of our conversation? And so it's sort of just we're not really noticing it, but actually it's part of what's being experienced right now. So we can actually, if we want, as just as a game in a sense, but a profoundly transformative one, to just let oneself notice, well, notice anything and everything, because you'll actually, you can actually begin to see that none of it is insignificant. The, the, but the interpretive mind that's kind of go, discounting it as like, that's not really significant. Don't you don't need to pay any attention to that. The way that little leaf happens to be lying on the ground. Who cares? Doesn't matter, right? But actually, even from a physics standpoint, you're looking at the laws of nature right there, aren't you? No less the laws of nature than looking at the Grand Canyon. Same laws of nature, physically speaking. And then beyond that, just perceptually, you're looking at you can't really say what you're looking at. You're looking at some kind of um, I mean, there's no words for it, of course, because in a sense, the the leaf lying there in the way that it's lying on the ground isn't, there's no, this is the curious thing about our experience is that, and it's really central to what I'm writing about and teaching, is that there's no, it appears that there's no label that's intrinsic to the, what's to the phenomena that is appearing. In other words, it, it's, it's not, saying I'm this. It's not saying I'm, I'm a si- desk. I'm, I'm a desk. It's not saying I'm of no interest or value or meaning meaning. But consciousness is doing that essentially through its magical interpretive faculties, right? Of not of rendering things, not just what is it, the word that we might have it for a desk, but then on top of that, the additional layers of interpretation of does this mean anything? Is it significant? Is it a potential threat or benefit? That's another, right? A layer of interpretation that goes on quite a bit, it would seem, as organisms. Like, how am I going to, like, is this okay? And where is this going to lead to in the future? And that will that be okay? So these layers upon layers of ways that we're rendering this, um, which are all fine as far as they go, and they have their, it would seem to be, they have, they're part of an expression of life, of course. Um, they are also, you know, the laws of nature, we could say, perfectly expressing an aspect of reality. But the question for, for me is, in my work with people is, is that the whole story? Mm-hmm. Are the interpretations actually telling us what's here? Are they really conveying to us um, what's present? And they're not, they're not. The label whatever the label is, you know, some subjective state, you say fear, 
It's just a word, right? What, what is it actually telling you about the experience? The experience is like a universe <laughs> of God knows what. What is, as I say, what is any experience made of, experientially speaking, what is it made of? Like what are the, what are the constituent elements of experience itself? And people could say, well, a state like fear or joy is made of some constellation of thoughts and emotions and but that of course begs the question right what are those what are those things yeah what are those so this is just this curious thing that we have words to seemingly characterize what's happening here two people sitting in a room having a conversation for example that's a description of this event um, one description but what's at what's what that description is actually signifying or referring to referencing in our in our actual experience right now is i mean it just doesn't even touch the the magnitude and complexity and richness and boundlessness of what's here experientially which is quite something to discover <laughs> to put it mildly <laughs> man oh as he as you're pointing through this there's so many so many little offshoots pop into the mind of connections so when when you know there's a lot so we'll try to keep it simple first thing when angelo delulo uh my friend who we've done a few shows with actually that's how we kind of also connected is you were going to yep. reach out to me because yep. you'd seen a show with angelo yeah he was sitting in that chair and he said you know when i was walking up today to the studio from your parking lot down the underground parking garage. He said, the garage was just radiant. I mean, it's not a garage. It's just radiant, indescribable life. And I felt this deep connection and love because I was also that. And I was like, I was in love with a garage, if you think of it con conceptually. Right. But you're not thinking, you're not conceptualizing, you're just experiencing unfiltered reality in that moment. And it's perfect and it's radiant and it's alive. So that that's one thing. Yeah. Um, the second yeah. thing he said is when we were sitting here, he said, you know, and I said, so how are you experiencing reality? He goes, well, you can experience reality just by dropping, like allowing those filters to kind of drop those conceptualizations that mm -hmm. build us that sort of pseudo world on top of whatever's mm -hmm. happening. Mm -hmm. That is, like you said, it's another expression of mm -hmm. the laws of everything. Mm -hmm. But when that drops, he's like, looking anywhere is like looking in the face of God. You're just seeing radiant phenomena and even mm -hmm. calling them phenomenon doesn't make sense because they're here and gone, here and gone before you can nail them down. Yeah, you can't really say, you can't really say what you're seeing in a way, you know, you can't, it just doesn't collapse into something sayable, something thinkable, something definable, even though language and conceptualization leads us to believe that it is collapsible, which is how we get through our day. Seem to live in the world that we think we live in, which is a world of objects and in various forms of relationship and sometimes collision with one another. And um, as, as I often say, it's not that that frame of reference is wholly wrong or invalid within that frame of reference. It's like within the frame of reference of being a body, a bo embodied creature organism, living in a world, that's frame of reference, right? An objective world. If this organism goes, walks outside and runs into another object like a car, from within that whole frame of reference, this organism, that may be the end of this organism as we know it, right? Um, but this is the curious thing is, is that, that that is just not the only perspective. <laughs> there's this other perspective. I call it the experiential perspective. It's, it's like, it's not assuming anything actually even about uh, a physical objective world. It's not denying the existence of it. It's just for purposes of investigation. It's like, what is it like to um, explore this experiential perspective? So let me not presume that something like boundaries between objects exists. Let me look in my experience to see, for example, as one example of this, whether any boundaries can actually be found and in an experience they can't there's no boundaries mm. so that's rather amazing because and and you can one can actually feel that discover that perspective experiential perspective of the 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 perspective that ha where there are no seams in the fabric of reality and you point to this in your exercises yeah all yeah. the time i'm sort of basically that's essentially what i'm trying to do is point out the ways in which 
the direct experience or the experiential perspective um, basically doesn't correlate with the interpretations. It deviates from, right? I mean, the, the, the interpreted perspective is there's two individuals here having a conversation. Experientially, that's not what's happening. Right. It's just flat out not, and, not and, what's and happening. And let me, let me, let me, dive into a little bit of what yeah. you're saying. And we can we should talk a little bit about Donald Hoffman's theories too, which we both have, have had an interest in. Yeah. We can link to that. I'll link to them on my show with him as well, because cool. this all dovetails into that. But but just let's stick with experience right now, because mm -hmm. I think we'll lose people who feel like, what is this about? I don't understand why this matters to me. Well, yeah. so let's point right at our experience. Yeah. So if I'm looking, and you can help me with this, because mm -hmm. you, this is what you do in terms of pointing. You're saying, uh, you know, Z, when I look at experience, I don't see boundaries between, mm -hmm. say, myself and experience. In fact, the idea of myself and this is, is conceptual. Mm -hmm. So let me investigate. And yeah. I'll say, but John, look at my hand. Like mm -hmm. there's a skin border right. and there's air <laughs> and yeah. there's world. And I can feel my hand here, but I don't necessarily feel my hand here, I think. How, hmm. Wait a minute now. So let me just feel the sensations of my hand. Do they stop at the skin? Well, see, the tricky thing about approaching it in that way is that you're already talking about experiencing an object, right? Called the hand. You, you've already you're already conceptualized. You're already there, and so now you're like, I mean, it's understandable that that we would start from that sort of assumption, but if you come back to, don't assume that there's a hand there. Just what are you experiencing that you're calling a hand? Mm. And if you, if you, whether you are doing it sensorily, like feeling it sort of touch or proprioception, like say with your eyes closed and you feel what you call the hand, and then you feel what you imagine is outside of the hand, I mean, you can do that. So <laughs> feel, feel it, let's call it sensation, feel the sensation of, of the hand and okay so now here's the question which is if the hand is something that has independent existence that's somehow been plucked out of its context in other words it's it's actually autonomously existing separate thing from reality that has a clear boundary around it in other words that's the the definition around the hand that distinguishes it from non-hand and experientially feeling it like proprioceptively as let's say sensation, there's absolutely no edge to the sensation. There's no point where, again, it's very easy for the interpretive faculties to kind of suck us back into, well, wait a minute, wait a minute, the hand is, there is no hand there. <laughs> Experientially, there's experience there. That's, that's the thing. And when you feel the experience, you just feel what, what could be called a continuum of experiencing. And you don't find pieces. You don't find hands and non-hands. You find, I mean, I could designate, but then, I'm, then I've just split the continuum of experiencing up into an object, which is not actually what I'm encountering. I'm just, the, the space around the hand. I mean, here's another way to, to get this, what I'm talking about. So if you feel the hand as something that's present experientially, like a phenomena, what you're calling hands, you just feel the presence of that. And then feel the presence of what's the world that that hand exists in. It's one presence. It's, it's, there's no, there's not two things there. It's just presence. Ooh, man, when that, when that, clicks this ocean of presence without a boundary it is it it's when the mind comes back and tries to wrap around it it just simply can't and it goes that's just a hand <laughs> right yeah space. it'll go back to it'll go back to concepts yeah which is fine yeah. i mean that's again if you see they're like i've been talking about this recently like with, with my grad students and showing them the um there's a couple of really famous visual illusions, mm -hmm. you know, the one with the, the vase, and then there's two profiles. Right, so two pictures. Right, it's like, but it's one image. Right. Isn't it? Right. It's a single image, visual image. But the but mind can, splits but it. But it can be seen in mm -hmm. two very distinct ways that are completely different. And this is kind of what we're talking about. It's like you can see 
the world as separate pieces and parts. Like I can see a hand lying on a table. Yeah. But simultaneous to that way of framing it, of holding it conceptually, is the actual direct experience of table and hand. It's kind of like with the – now instead of looking at the – let's say the table and the hand is the vase – I'm just looking and seeing, actually, there's just a field of experiencing. Same same reality seen in two completely different ways. One being bounded and discrete, separate, separable objects, and the other as unbounded um, presence, just a field of being, a field of presence, a field of experiencing. Those are kind of synonyms in my, you know, each one may be evocative in a slightly different way of what I'm talking about. I- and, and the word you used, evocative, is mm. I think important because you say this as well in your book. Hopefully you, evocative. <laughs> hopefully evocative. <laughs> yeah. E- evocish. <laughs> evocative. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's um, w- words, language will never step up to the plate of fully describing any experience, even the mm-hmm. simplest experience. So the best you can do as a pointer mm-hmm. is to evoke a look, a, an experiential feeling, you feel into what's actually happening. Mm-hmm. And so this is my sense of, of it. And mm-hmm. and so th- these kind of pointers can evoke a sense of, oh yeah, there is this world where we have objects where we've created the overlays and that, mm-hmm. okay, that's fine. That's a perspective. Now, what about if I just look at without the overlays, if I just look at the raw experience, oh wow, everything melts into what? This presence and the word presence. Mm -hmm. You have a chapter in this book that I thought was just so on point. It's talking about what is, what is, so, and again, this gets to the root of why care about this. Mm -hmm. So, Mm -hmm. oh man, John and Z are just tripping balls, man. They're just talking about, they're just staring at death. Very abstract. It's like, how's this relevant to my life? Doesn't make any, it doesn't have any relevance to me as a nurse on the floor suffering every day. And yet, when you actually experience reality in the raw, mm-hmm. you realize a few things. It's it's a uncon- it's 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 a it's a knowing. It's not a conceptual realization, and that mm-hmm. is that it's only now. Mm-hmm. It's radiantly here. It's perfect, and it's a kind of presence that you can drop into experientially. That is so without a problem. There's mm-hmm. no problem to solve. There's no issue. It's just this, and it's perfect, and that is liberation from suffering in this moment. Yeah, you're you're you no know, exactly and and you know when you just cuz cuz there's different ways to even though you can't really talk about the uh, the experiential perspective cuz it's it's not you know it's indeterminate it's it's indefinable and resolvable different ways to describe it ineffable describability. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> ineffable. Um I mean one of its one of its characteristics is that it lies outside of language and description. And as part of that, non, it's non-conceptual nature, you could say, it has no, um, there's no lack there. There's no problem there. There's no insufficiency there. Because those, of course, are all characterizations and descriptions, right? Aren't they? Like if I say the moment is lacking in some way, so I've just rendered the moment or rendered myself. You know, I'm lacking in X, Y, or Z. But when you go back to the feeling of the moment, what the felt sense of what's here that has no label attached to it, and then you just, in a sense, let yourself, in a sense, just perceive what's here. You don't have to, and I don't really think outside of doing something more dramatic, like whether a drug or going on a month long meditation retreat where you can kind of, or like Jill Pulte Taylor had a stroke where, right. you know, the interpretive apparatus kind of goes offline completely. That's not necessary because like that example of the, the vase and the two profiles, I don't have to eradicate either of those to see the other. They're, they're living, they're cohabitating rather happily with one another. In fact, they are the same image. Mm. And that's that's the beautiful integration of this, that the it can seem, especially early on in this kind of exploration, that there's a dichotomy because the interpreted world, the implications of it are so different from the uninterpretable world. Right. In, in, including in the way you just- Survival. Eloquently said around, you know, I perceive- like 
if I feel myself as a vulnerable creature um, subject to the world of experience and circumstance that could at any moment crush me, literally, um, either crush me psychologically, existentially, or physically, right? Um, that, well, that's that explains how human beings could suffer when that perspective is the primary, if not sole perspective, a way of experiencing life, right? Because shit happens, you know? Mm. Difficult things happen, you could say. Stuff happens, bodies break down, um, people lose relationships. I mean, so many things can happen in the course of life, you know? Um, jobs end, or jobs are difficult to find, pandemics happen, you know, right? In that whole world, it's like we're in this place of often trying to find our way to a place of that we would consider well-being, the place that we're looking for to have a sense of a ground of well-being and enjoyment and happiness. It's, this is just seems like a universal, right, drive in the human. And we're usually going about that project, the happiness project, the well-being project, by essentially um, trying to arrange the pieces of our life in such a way the circumstances, the subjective states, so that we have more of what we equate with well-being and less of what we imagine is not well-being, essentially. So we're like, th that whole process of like, um, this needs to be there, this can't be there. We're like arranging all the pieces. And, and then comes along this other perspective that I'm introducing, where we actually investigate the pieces of life that we think need to be arranged in a particular way in order for me to be okay as an organism. Understandable, that perspective. I get it. You know, I want to have healthy food and nourishing relationships and, right? I, I'm human in that, in that regard. Maslow's hierarchy, you need those basics. I, I, wa to, I want yeah. those things. I love those things. I seek them out. I seek out enjoyable experiences and moments that are resonant with my own values and orientation. Of course I do. But meanwhile- there's this transcendental indescribability that's pervading all of it. Mm. It's pervading all the seeming parts and pieces that I'm trying to control and micromanage in order to be okay. So, so you can imagine like seeing that other perspective, feeling into the reality of like, wow, it's like in a sense, no matter how I move the pieces around, nothing actually changes. Reality remains itself. Mm. Re reality remains its astonishing, inconceivable, miraculous, indescribable, infinite nature. It's always that, even though it can look very finite and describable and resolvable and potentially threatening, right? So it can certainly look that way. But then from this other perspective, you're like, on the one hand, there you are, you know, you're, you're getting older, you're losing your faculties, your control is being stripped from you, your agency is being stripped, maybe even your capacity to, to reason in the ways you once were able to reason, you know, all these things being potentially stripped away from you. Here I'm speaking about old age in particular, but, and yeah, from that perspective, it's like, wow, that could be a lot of suffering, right? A lot of loss, a lot of heartbreak. And again, not to deny any of that aspect of it. Then there's this other vantage, right? It's like, well, what's going on here more primally? Like what's, what is, the, what is this body that's I'm describing as falling apart, for example? And it's pure indescribable radiance, the body. So from that perspective, there is no, the radiance doesn't fall apart. The radiance remains, you know, the, the ocean remains the ocean, even when the wave is, is essentially Another wave crashes into one wave and smashes that wave, destroys that wave, overwhelms, you know, that wave, that littler wave. And from the perspective of the little wave, it's like, oh, Jesus. You yeah, know, it's like it's game that, over. That was, that was really, that was really rough. <laughs> you know, uh, uh, I've been destroyed and the whole process of it maybe was very overwhelming and painful and scary. And then that's the perspective of being a subject in a world a wave-like phenomena in a world of lots of other phenomenal waves, right? That can crush me at any moment or overwhelm me or stress me out. And then here's a perspective of the ocean that is all of these waves, the ocean of life or reality or whatever you want to call it, that, that is the, it's giving rise to everything, that is the basis of everything um, phenomenally or experientially. 
And that remains unsullied. It remains indestructibly itself, no matter the forms or shapes that it's taking or assuming. It's it's absolutely unconditioned by what's appearing. It's unconditioned by what's being experienced. So there's this beingness or this presence of the moment, and then this wave of sadness arises or heartbreak or confusion that we would describe in those ways. And that doesn't that is that is not something, yeah, from from one perspective, it's something that I don't like. It's overwhelming. Please stop, you know, help me to figure out some way to stop those waves from happening. Like I got that. And then from this other perspective, it's like, I'm not a I'm not an individual wave subject to the world of phenomena and potentially the victim of it, right? I'm actually just I'm not a victim of life. I'm an expression of life. Wow. That turns the entire thing upside down on its head. It's like, things are not happening to me. Uh, whatever I am is the happening of the universe, the happening of, you know, it's the continuation of the Big Bang, basically. Like this is, you know, what you are as an organism, as a body, mind, everything about, you know, Z is just, just like every other apparent form is an expression of the whole, an expression of life. And then from that vantage, it's like, wow, it's a really different, you know, health, illness, psychological challenges, and then, you know, old age and death <laughs> eventually are all the, literally the radi- radiating, shining forth creative energy of the universe itself. It's like, well, isn't that's a very different way to encounter them, isn't it? Like, that's what I mean, 180 degrees different, <laughs> right? Then, oh my God, I'm, I'm overwhelmed by my life. It's like, no, no, I am my life. What do you mean overwhelmed by my life? Like I am life. See the difference? I, I literally am life as is everything. And from that perspective, there's just not two things here. There's just one thing, whatever we call it, there's no name for it. The Tao that can be named is not the real Tao. It's not the real Tao. Tao Te Ching says. Non-duality, so, all these yeah. terms that we use. And and I have to say one thing, yeah. that was beautiful. I mean, what I have to say is one thing is that this is not a conceptual knowing. You're not teaching your mind, oh, I'm just life or right. I'm one thing, or there's no subject in a world of objects. It's just this. That's not a conceptual knowing. It's an experiential yeah inquiry into this like you experience right. it because it is actually what's happening it is what we're experiencing yes actually <laughs> yes but you're right it's not like just to understand it conceptually i mean that might be an initial intriguing doorway like a into wedge into exploring it. you right. know like because in some ways i don't know from my standpoint at least it actually does make logical sense to think about it in some of the ways i'm i mean it makes it has a kind of logic to it to me that that is, even though it's also transrational and mm-hmm. nonlinear, you know, in terms of, yeah, it makes no sense whatsoever in a way, like in terms of being able to put it into some sense-making narrative. Right. But even when I describe like how experientially, like using that metaphor of the ocean that I often use that it's like, yeah, you can look, this is a wild thing, you know, like harkens back to the visual illusion of, the vases and the profiles or that other one with the younger woman and the older woman. Right. Which one is it? And so we look out at the sea. Um, I live near the sea, fortunately, and I get to look at it a lot. And we can definitely see what we would describe as waves that are in some sort of interaction with one another. Right? And that have a certain kind of life, a certain kind of autonomous existence as a wave that has a beginning, you know, middle and end, let's say, of its life course as a wave. But we can also look and just see there's one thing here. There's one thing, one sea, and all the waves are simply, we could say, if anything, the, the expression of this one thing. And this is very much you know, this is very much what we're feeling, you know, a moment of joy. We're feeling the one thing being described as joy, seeming to resolve in some way as this describable patterning of life or energy or whatever it actually is a patterning of. I don't really know what it's a pattern of, which is really- When gets I mean, gets to the point of the inconceivability of any experience. Yeah, I mean, that is a really trippy thing that you could say 
you know, how do we recognize any phenomena objective seemingly to, from us, you know, or subjective? Um, how do we recognize, how is there some recognition of what that is and then the subsequent labeling of it? You know, you have like, let's take a subjective experience, like you experience worry about your kids, okay? I don't know, they're going away to like overnight camp and you feel this feeling of worry about, about how it's going to go for them. Are they going to like it? Are they going to be safe? You're a parent. Okay. So what just happened? What's actually there that consciousness is seeing, recognizing, and then labeling as something that's present? What is it actually? Well, and, and how is it distinct as a phenomenal, a phenomena that's appearing to consciousness, let's say, how is it distinct from, I don't know, some other label that we might give to a different state like inspiration? You know, I'm so inspired my kids are going off to, 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 to this sleepaway camp. It's inspiring to me that they're willing to do this. So you have this whole other set. It's like a different pattern of life, a different way that the life itself has sort of a seeming, seems to have assembled itself constitute its, itself. But but the wild thing is, is that you see the pattern, you recognize, you f- there it is. It's like, I, I know it, I recognize it seemingly. I have a name for it, it's worry. And you tell your partner, I'm worrying about the kids. So you like have a name for it, right? This recognizable pattern. So then my work is, okay, cool. We already know that whole way of perceiving the world. I mean, that's like consensus reality. Consensus reality, right. conceptual world. Yeah. Yes. But what's actually there? What is it a pattern of? I say like, if you look in the night sky and you see a constellation that ha- we have a name for it, whatever it is, Big Dipper, it's an obvious one, or Ryan's belt. So that's that's a pattern that we're seeing, recognized, familiar, and we have a name for it. So it's very similar, right? In that sense. So we could say that the Big Dipper is a pattern of what lights in the night sky that have a, seem to kind of shape themselves in a certain way, recognizable. So we, we can say kind of what the pattern is constituted of in that case. But what is the pattern of your worry? Like, what what is that? <laughs> I'm actually really like asking that question. Like, what is it? What is actually there that sh- that's appearing as what we then call this particular pattern, rec- seemingly recognizable pattern. And it's fascinating to me that, I mean, I'm a psychologist. Psychologist, to my knowledge, I mean, I'm no, like, I don't have some huge reach in terms of my read of the discipline of psychology because it's so vast, but I'm not really aware of this being a topic of conversation among psychologists. <laughs> it's more like, here's these states of mind, People are challenged by them, troubled by them, feel the victims of them, want to become free of these states of mind somehow, find their way to heal them, whatever. But but we haven't started at square one, like as a discipline or, or just human culture to say, what the hell are what these? What are they? <laughs> what actually, like I want to I want to do something about them because yep. we. I'm assuming that they're a problem, right? Right? Yep. Uh, or I say they're uncomfortable, but of course that's another label. What's actually there? What's actually present? And that's what can be explored and um, can be, you know, to your question about the pragmatic value of this, um, it's it's all about, well, we could say, I would say two sort of very related things. One is discovering this inconceivable perspective, the experiential perspective that's not, doesn't resolve as any frame of reference, conceptual frame of reference, is what what's the fruit of that discovery? And uh, continuing to explore it and revel in it and appreciate it is um, more enjoyment of reality and less suffering. I mean, how much more, do you, that's what human beings want, more enjoyment, less suffering. And there it is in your actual experience right now is boundless enjoyment that's free of actual problem, completely transcends what we think of as problematic, inherently transcends it. And it's right here, it's your birthright. This is what we are. I mean, so so there's a few, <laughs> yeah. I mean, there, and it's funny cause you know, the, the journey you just took us on, like all of that is it's perplexing 
and a deep mystery. What's sitting right in front of us, the biggest mystery in the entire universe is sitting right in front of us. Why is there this? What is anxiety? Like just the question, what is anxiety? I'm, call, I'm, I'm a little anxious about this interview. Okay, what is that? Mm -hmm. Okay, well, no, it's this feeling of anxiety. Okay, what, what is that? Well, okay, let me look at that. Let me look at that. Close eyes, feel. Where do I feel that? Oh, I'll feel it in the chest, a little bit in the stomach. It's like butterflies. What do you mean butterflies? Really feel into that. Can you describe it more? It's kind of difficult to describe, right? So just feel it. Uh -huh. Well, now it's this vibrant radiating. I mean, the words aren't doing it, but you guys who've had anxiety know what this is. Just dive, dive. You may not know what it is. You may know the concept of what it is mm -hmm. because you have something that you've talked about, which is cognitive fusion, where mm -hmm. the concept of what something is, is fused with the actual thing that it is right. to the point where they become one. But in reality, right. no one said this is anxiety. <laughs> that's no. the concept that's become fused. And now right. that feeling is by de facto, the mind just puts it together tick, 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 and conceptualize it as anxiety. But what if you let that go and you dived into what it actually was? Oh, that's a very different experience. It doesn't have all the associated thought production of, oh my God, this terrible thing is happening, that terrible thing, none of which I can do anything about. Um, it doesn't trigger all these other emotions that are associated with that. Instead, it's just the raw sensation. And as that opens up in presence, you realize, first of all, is there even a self suffering this? Mm -hmm. And you look for that in experience and you have trouble finding that because what is that? And then you realize, boy, even uh, it's just this, just this, it becomes impossible to talk about. But Pretty perfect much. to experience, <laughs> perfect to experience. Like, you know, you open with wide-eyed wonder at it and people go, oh man, this is like, you know, when you, you people who do psychedelics are just staring at their root beer. Like right. you said, yeah, envy that <laughs> right. as long as you can continue. Cause like you said, it's the two are simultaneous. You can experience both, but having the capacity to experience mm -hmm. the pure, raw, unfiltered reality in an unconceptual way in this moment is liberation. Mm -hmm. And then you can always go back to the con concepts when you need to fill gas in your car or take the MCAT or whatever it is you need to do. Yeah, absolutely. But you 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 allow a an escape from a created kind of suffering. It's almost like there's two there's there's more than two worlds, but there's two large divisions. There's the conceptual putting together that Hoffman would say, mm -hmm. you start out with raw reality, whatever that is, and he'll mm -hmm. say it's experience. Mm -hmm. It's just pure experience, whatever that is, because mm -hmm. we don't know what it is, it's right. a deep mystery. It's raw experience and the human mind is a series of sort of more complex sets of experiencing agents, whatever that is, it's just mm -hmm. like experience experiencing itself that can complexify, exchange experience and build into higher elements that then create a label anxiety. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but if you were to drop down the layers of consciousness agents to just the raw experience of anxiety. It's just a scintillating, impossible to describe, infinitely deep and nuanced energy field. And that even doesn't even begin to touch it. No, it doesn't. It doesn't touch it. That's, that's the thing is that there's, you know, I mean, any experience you, you, this is the curious thing is that I, I, publish a little free ebook. It's on my website. It's called Everything is a Doorway. And it's just these little kind of um, mini invitations to explore what, what it is we're talking about right now to discover this, this inconceivable, magical, <laughs> mysterious uh, thing that seems to be happening here, that it's, it's convenient because you can look anywhere, anywhere in the field of experience you know, it's like holographic in a sense in that whatever, pe every piece is the whole. Yeah. Right? Like a dream. Like every part of the dream is the dream. Is the dream. It? Yeah. It's not like, there's not pieces. There's not little pieces. And there's no, if you want to find out what a dream is like, you can go to any of the parts of the dream and whether it's a blissful, you know, moment of intimacy in the dream or a terrorizing, horrific, you know, being chased by the demon in the dream. Actually, in terms of, you want to know what is a dream like? It's like, well, it's all the dream. So anywhere you go in the dream, you'll find the dream, right? Mm -hmm. So, you know, the corollary here in the, what we would- like, in the, waking the waking dream. <laughs> the waking dream <laughs> um, is that anywhere you go, you find, you could say the life dreaming, you know, like this is life dreaming. This is- this is reality, you know, dreaming is maybe not the right word. I don't really know what it really isn't a word, but 
the, the, the creative, you know, the creative engine of each instant, you know, what is, um, I mean, isn't that, <laughs> I say early on in the book that, um, you know, the ordinary approach to kind of well-being, as we were talking about earlier, is like the sort of the life improvement project, you know, make make life better. Yeah, polish polish this thing up. Yeah, polish <clears throat> it up, you know, to try to enhance it, which is fine. But what is life? What is the life that we're trying to enhance to make better? We might be surprised to discover it by itself without any elaboration, without any accoutrements, it is inherently, this, this is my sense, if I were to put sort of words to sort of maybe its primal qualities, even though it's really beyond any kind of conceptual qualities, would be it's just all nourishing. It's, it's um, of course, unthinkably vital and alive, right? It's just shimmering with, with, with aliveness. It's um, whole. It, it's, it's, it's that which is inclusive of everything, so it is the whole. So there's the wholeness we're searching right here. This very moment is the wholeness we're searching. Every piece, every experience is inseparable from the wholeness we're seeking, is made of the wholeness. So everywhere we go, we find the same thing. We find, well, we find reality. So, you know, we're never, we're never actually apart from it. We're never cast out of it somehow and then needing to f trace our steps back to reconnect with it, you know? How like, could you be? No, I mean, how, how could you yeah, be apart really, from how, it from even a second? Where well, exactly. are you going to go? Yeah. <laughs> Where are you going to go? It's just And this. there's no returning to it either, even though right. it can sometimes feel like Feels a kind like of a that. homecoming. Right. Like, oh my God, it's like, I can't believe I imagined this was missing for so much of my life. And now I feel like I'm I'm home like, again. You after know? you had that awakening, yeah. you said you you wept for two days straight. Yeah, that was crazy. It was like the tears were... They were such a amazingly beautiful mix of like just the sheer joy of homecoming, you know, mm. coming back to the home, the one home that is everything and just feeling like that sense of home, like this, just as it is, per the great perfection. And then the tears had were mixed together with tears of like, Wow, and for so long you thought that you were apart from this. Right. Like they were like they were like bittersweet tears. Heartbreaking, they, were like, yeah. they were like, wow, you know, like the tragedy at one level of you know, and that even the tragedy of human suffering of like imagine it, you know, I'll listen to people talk about how broken how they, broken are, they yeah. feel and how much they feel, you know, been traumatized by their lives. And again, not to deny human experience, why would I ever do that? But um that's not the whole story. Mm -hmm. And here is this absolute, just, um, I mean, right? The cosmos, everything is, uh, this is the, the expression of, of, the, of the absolute reality of the cosmos and just full of this vitality, this nourishment, this um, beneficence, this um, complete equanimity. Um, and, and that is... Uh, of course, what if there's anything that keeps us from recognizing what I'm just describing? Right. It's the just a very well worn, innocent habit we've been whatever inculcated ourselves as human culture with, uh, or really life has done this. The intelligence of life is doing it all. <laughs> right. Uh, it, it's sort of missing itself. You know, it right. imagines it's missed itself. It's imagined. It's imagined it has been cast out of itself and then seeks to re-find itself, you know, and yeah. fill itself back up. But of course, it's never actually been empty of anything because it is itself fully in everything. And so, always. Yeah. Right, and always. And, <laughs> Even when it's in delusion, right. apparent delusion, right. But that that tendency to kind of orient back to the, like I could be saying what I was just saying to you about the all nourishing nature of this and the absolute bounty of it and the wonder of it. And then- if someone's orienting back to their kind of life circumstances in They're the like, description of like, what are you bullshit. talking about? Yeah. My life really sucks and this, right. this, 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 this. I can, I, I've got a list of things right. that are wrong right. with it. 
Right. And you're telling me there's nothing wrong. Right. So you see how those seem irreconcilable, right? right. How do you make, you know, and again, it's perspective, right? Yeah, because from one perspective, if, you know, you could be, you know, without means, financial means, you could, you could, your health could be impaired in some way. Um, and so, and you're telling me there's no problem. And so it feels like, um, a kind of bypass. Yeah. yeah. In fact, mm -hmm. I, uh, um, my partner at the time read a draft of the book. Um, it was close to being done. I felt like it was ready to be done, but I wanted to share it with her. And, um, and she, she had one pretty strong reaction, which was, I feel like you're discounting people's suffering. Right. Right. Yeah. And so I was like, hmm, I definitely don't want to, I don't want people to have that experience because I'm not, number one, but I don't want that to be what what they're taking from it. Right. Because uh, it's a misunderstanding of what I'm trying to say. So maybe I need to add a chapter. So I just added a short chapter uh, that I created as a sort of a fake dialogue, basically, a seeming dialogue between two people, but asking this question, like it feels like you're just overlooking people's actual real suffering right. by talking about, you know, the, the perfection yeah, of this the perfection moment. Of yeah. this moment, right? And so I think I titled the chapter something like, are you saying that suffering isn't real? Mm. And then I talk about the paradox of, no, I'm not really saying that. No, everything's real. All suffering's the, real, pain is real. That's why suffering Experience matters. is, you know, it's like, I say it's exactly what you think it is actually. Yeah, that's right. It's just much more than that too. It's more than that too. It's more than that too. And that more than that, that's where you discover this this perspective of the you could say the perfection of it yeah the the, um, the well-being that's inherent to life itself that's right um but if you keep going back to the description then it's it, it can be easy seemingly easy easier to miss it because you keep going back to you know the the physicist is telling you you know this is not a water bottle here this is a dance of quantum fluctuations and you're like yeah, but come on, come on! Pal. I need to drink. I can see the water bottle. Yeah, 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 You're like, yeah, yeah, come on! Yeah. So you keep going back, and it's like, right? It's like just it, like any kind of learning, isn't it? Like if you think that two plus two equals five, and then some mathematician comes along and tells you, no, 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 it's four, but you keep seeing it as five. It's like you you have a tendency to go back to the frame, familiar frame of reference, right? And then someone's telling you, well, maybe even worse. You know, there aren't even any numbers there, you know? <laughs> right? Um, and and then you're like, come on! It's like I know it is this way. I'm convinced it is, and that's the fusion. That's the that's cognitive, cognitive fusion. fusion yeah. That's believing that the world is what I think it is, essentially, and having fused together what's here with the subsequent sort of rendering of it, interpretive rendering. It, of it. It's it's what Hoffman would describe as the rookie error of mistaking our interface for reality. Mm -hmm. So all of science is kind of taking the conceptual interface mm -hmm. that we build around the raw, unfiltered, radiant reality of reality. However mm -hmm. we do that, we don't know, right? It's yeah. a mystery. But God, the, com the human supercomputer does exactly. this. Exactly. instantly, it is such an unbelievable supercomputer. And persistently from birth, and it gets more conditioned to do it even better and better and better as we get educated. Now, suddenly, instead of seeing uh, uh, um, a TV, just as a TV, we can see it as a series of diodes and pixels and go, oh, that thing was put together. Oh, that's an OLED, so that uses an organic. Light. And so all mm -hmm. the different, but, but all of that is, it's a true expression of life. But if you are stuck in that, in that frame of reference as the only frame of reference you have access to, because you've never dropped into the raw frame of reference, mm -hmm. you are potentially trapped in a point where, as Hoffman says, you take the interface seriously. Like you take a, a train coming at you seriously, but you don't take it literally. Right. You don't say, oh, that's a train. You know, that's a series of, I don't know what, but mm -hmm. my mind is putting it together as train. And I know that in a conventional sense, mm -hmm. this body and that train, when they meet, it will mm -hmm. not be good for the continuance of the conventional reality that I call Zubin. Right. So I take it seriously. But if suffering is happening, like it's, you've lost mm -hmm. a job, Mm -hmm. And you're just beat up, you, that feeling of anxiety and you're mm -hmm. laving that anxiety, a feeling of regret, all these other guilt, mm -hmm. shame, mm -hmm. all those things. If, if that's your only reality, you are going, that 
entity is gonna suffer, 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 suffer without seeming recourse. Right. But if it also knows <laughs> and can drop into this practice with mm -hmm. these practices and with, with just being present, being, just being instead of doing all the time, mm -hmm. suddenly there's an, another world where it's like, oh, that suffering is just a pattern and those are just thoughts and okay, okay, relief. And then I can reconstitute and I can get on mm -hmm. and do something spontaneously from a place of equanimity that's probably more efficacious than spinning my wheels in suffering. Mm -hmm. So there are the practical ramifications. You're a, a psychologist. It's like, there's so much practicality, but it seems like the whole field of psychiatry, psychology, medicine, mm -hmm. we're about moving our interface around. <laughs> and Pretty what much. if we actually said, okay, yeah, there's the interface and we're really good at the interface. Man, our medicines somehow interface with the interface and they do things, but deeper than that, is, and that may be why psychedelics have that effect, like you said. They mm -hmm. get under the interface, allow you to see raw reality for a bit, reset mm -hmm. your sense of what's possible and change your entire point of view. I used to make this distinction between relative medicine and ultimate medicine. Oh, interesting. And so the, you know, the relative medicine would be, I have a headache and I have the, the pain of that. And then I take various steps to try to address that phenomenon, mm. right? To, to, you know, apply various curative measures to it. It could be drink some more fluids, take an aspirin. Whatever that thing was applied directly to your forehead. Yeah, exactly, <laughs> you know, get a massage, do some acupuncture, take a drug, you know, if I have migraine headaches or something. Right, there's many, many ways under the sun mm. that we've developed to address the various, you know, psychological issues we find ourselves up against, physical health issues. Great, you know, it's like, and let we keep, hopefully, um, as we scientifically try to understand these things, you know, come up with better and better ways of modeling how to address those various challenges, health challenges, let's call them. And that, that's what I call the relative medicine because it's still addressing it at the level of the description. Mm. And no, no, no problem with that. But then there's the ultimate medicine, which is to realize that the the pain that I'm experiencing is, in, is not merely pain. It's, um, again, what is pain? <laughs> What's mm -hmm. actually there? Mm -hmm. and, and so then those two approaches to life or well-being or whatever, they, they can happily coexist. It's not like you give applying up. the ultimate medicine, or, which is really just a seeing, it's not really right. an application. Right. Um, seeing this sort of unbounded perspective, indescribable perspective, it doesn't negate the the value of applying other methods, right? Hmm. Relative methodologies to the things that challenge us in life. But it's like, um, but it, it opens us up to a whole nother way. I mean, because there's many times when we're, we're actually trying to micromanage our experience unnecessarily. You know, it's not always that we have a broken bone that we need to set, you know, and by the doctor, um, which maybe arguably would be harder to only see it as it's in its sort of absolute transcendental nature and not address it at the, but there's so many things, the kind of the, the, the little hassles and stressors and challenges of day-to-day -day life and functioning where those can be, discovered to be this radiant, just yeah. shining forth of reality that actually don't present any threat to the organism at all. They don't present any diminution of well-being. In fact, they are an expression of well-being and um, expression of being itself, of life itself. Of life itself. Right. And, and diving into those experiences in the raw, like really like, you know, I, I remember I was at that meditation retreat with Angelo and I started in day four. So I started having my, what I have this kind of chronic neck pain and mm -hmm. it probably comes from a lot of this and, <laughs> and some of it is just holding tension and, sure. and whatever. And I've got, you know, a million stories I tell myself about this neck pain. Mm -hmm. One of the stories is I'm never going to be normal again, or, um, I'm permanently damaged or, you know, I used to be okay and now I'm somehow broken. These are the little stories. That, sure. So when the pain happens, it's an energy sensation. The mind conceptualizes it as, oh shit, like this right. again. It's here comes I'm, this again. Here yeah. comes this again, suffering, et cetera. So it arose day three or four in meditation, which was shocking because normally it happens like every day. And it finally re-arose and with it came all the thoughts. But I, I had so much um, 
at that point I was in a concentrated state, but also I was in a more, I was more in touch with just being. Mm -hmm. And so these things arise and immediately the mind starts to conceptualize, oh no, here it is. How are you gonna finish the rest of this retreat? You're, you, it sucks. I'm sitting there, I'm like, I start to like move around. The stillness is kind of, and then I'm like, wait, 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 wait. Let me just be with this. What is this? Mm -hmm. Like, what is this? Close eyes, feel mm -hmm. into what, feel into what that is. And then, it starts no longer is it neck pain because that concept dropped away. Now it's just this energy and then it's indescribable. Mm -hmm. And then if I were gonna label it, it would be ecstatic, like an ecstatic field of boundless energy. And then the next thing is it was gone. <laughs> and that was just neck pain right. a minute ago. Yeah. that would have plagued me. And I'm not saying I cured the neck pain. I'm right. saying I allowed whatever that was to be what it was without the concept, without right. the suffering, without the overlay, without the construction of concept world. Right. And it was a game changer. Now, yeah, sure, I still get neck pain and I can be present with it. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I'm less good at it and sometimes mm -hmm. I'm better at it. But now I have that in my right. possibility Your tool kit. Yeah, in the kit. Yeah, and it's almost like the various things you, I'm sure you've done trying to address it, like medically they don't work whatever yeah yeah <laughs> Not i mean for me. right pain yeah. is you know we, we we don't do a great job with pain right yeah. it's right we don't have great answers for it often yeah but let's say one does x y or z to try to address it right and so those are all tools that we could potentially use to help mitigate this to help soften the pain to help relieve the pain and then then there's this other strategy which is maybe not the right word but and I would describe it as clarifying the nature of the pain, mm. clarifying what it is. Mm. That's like its own tool, if you would, mm. which, I mean, you described it beautifully. Like it, that investigation, just in a very simple sort of looking at it without the unadorned, you know, mm. without, without having to turn off the interpretive mechanisms, which is, I, again, I think- Can't do it. Can't really easily, do it very, yeah. very easily without taking more extreme measures. Like having a stroke yeah, or exactly. drugs, yeah. yeah. Jill Bol Bolte-Taylor, yeah. Yeah, but you, don't, but you don't need to turn it off because the actual, what, whatever it is that's actually there is, is not, in a sense, it's still there even while the interpretations are. So what's here is here, no matter what is being said about it, no matter what perspective is being layered on top of it. The raw truth is there. It's yeah. like something's here, something's here. And you know, one thing that we, we haven't touched on, which I think is worth mentioning because it's so powerful in terms of, I talked about exploring reality outside of the ways we imagine it to be and, and discover the ways in which it's so, so different from what we think is happening. And I think maybe one of the both simplest things to see, really, because it's staring us in the face mm. 24 seven, but also just so powerful to see is that there's no stability here. Ah, so I'm, I'm gonna stop you for a second because you did an exercise about this, I think mm. on Sam's app, mm. but you have it probably on your on your site and, and mm -hmm. elsewhere. And and this is, you know, in Buddhist speak, it's impermanence you're talking about, but let's yeah. forget about Buddhist speak because yeah. that's more concepts. Right. <laughs> it, um, you pointed right, and I'll let you do this, but I just had to tell you my experience with this because it was, really profound because it's not something impermanence is not it is not something that I, I that I often will focus on I'm often in my sitting thinking not thinking I'm focusing on selflessness more than the impermanence aspect of reality mm -hmm. I'm looking for self I'm inquiring but when you look at reality and you you're very careful mm -hmm. like close your eyes and feel your face was one that you did yeah this just feel what your face what is face what is this to dive into those sensations are they, can you grasp them? Do they stay for more than, I mean, do they stay at all? Can you pin them down? Anything you talk about them, it's already long past. It's like a waterfall of experience happening, constantly changing mm -hmm. in this moment. There's no other moment. And our mind is putting it together after the fact and then serving it us to, up to us right now because it can only be now. Mm -hmm. And that impermanence is a, once you really inhabit that, that you experience it, it's, it's transformative because you realize, oh, it's just such a dynamic interplay of nothing turning into something, turning into nothing in real time with nothing to grasp. Well, you can't, absolutely. And and the, the whole system of naming and describing and categorizing and characterizing phenomena really rests upon 
this the fantasy that things have continuity. Right. That we can actually create some narrative about this phenomena that, that, that in other words, it has stability, it has endurance over time. And we, again, we just pretty much take this for granted as human culture, that this is the case, that, that, that phenomena have continuity, but they actually don't. And because experientially, it, our experience is discontinuous. It does not have continuity. It's just here and it is here for no time. And you can feel, I mean, again, logically, something that's alive is not static. It's, move, it's movement, it's pure movement. And in its pure movement, it's, it's not like it moves and then it hangs out for a while as something that's, that's recognizable and nameable, although we believe that. We believe it, We yeah. believe it very strongly. We put it together we after put it together fact, like, yeah. Like, there it is, there is the worry. Right. It's, it, there's the pattern, presto, there's a pattern. It's kind of hanging in space like the Big Dipper, not moving long enough that I can go, there it is. It's, but yeah. when I feel, this is what I mean, why the emphasis on feeling what's here, when you feel what's here, what do you notice? That the feeling is dynamic, the perceiving is dynamic. And if I go to look for the pattern that I've labeled as worry or whatever, it's, I can't find it because that which has appeared as a pattern, let's see, experiential pattern, is in the very, in its very appearance, is dying. It, it, in other words, it's, it's like, you know, the sound of my voice, right? So the arising of the sound is the disappearance of the sound, isn't it? Yep. It's like, They're is it coming or is it going? You, would, you can't You tell. can't say yeah. unless you were to create a stopping point that's then the dividing line between the coming and then the going. Like here's, it, it gets to its destination, but with something that's moving that has no stopping because it's stat, it's not static, it's dynamic reality of experiencing. It's like, it's it's arriving, it, it's, it never arrives. It's just always going somewhere else. Yeah. And so that's why the experience of, they have this term in, in the Tibetan tradition of the unfindability of phenomena. Mm -hmm. So when you go to look for the phenomena, it's like, it keeps going away from you. Yeah. It keeps going away. You like, where is it? It just, it keeps slipping away, slipping away, slipping away. And because in a sense, there's not a thing there that's that's hanging out in time. There is no time. There's no time. There's no, there's time. no thing. It has no. It has no real essence beyond its appearance and disappearance, and that's it. So, so I, you know, here's the book. Oh, but wait, Z, like this is solid. Like I feel it. It's solid. It looks solid. It's stable in space and right. time. Like I don't understand. Okay, well then. Let's look at it. Right. Really look at this book. Well, that comes back to your earlier question about your hand. Right. Which is that if you start from the premise that there's a book there. Already. Right. Now you've already, the book is something that has continuity that you've just, it has object permanence like That's the psychologist right. would call as it, as right? As I said, yeah. But, but let's go back to how do you know that there's a book there because you're experiencing That's the right. book. That's right. And the experience of the book, although we, we overlook this, Consciousness just quickly creates in its supercomputer whatever intelligence that it is exhibiting moment by moment. Um, it's creating the illusion of of permanence over time. Like somehow, you know, actually that thing is the same now as it was a couple seconds ago as it was, you know, um, right? And But our actual experience yeah. is my experience of it is dynamic. So I'm perceiving it now and... Now I'm perceiving. No, what I'm perceiving perceiving now is not what I was perceiving an instant ago. That's the illusion. It, I'm perceiving something. It's it's just so it's, it's fresh, radically ephemeral. It's it's so yeah. It's yeah. just not even here long enough to say and, weirdly that it's even being experienced in a sense. And that's, and so, the, that's the mirage-like nature of it. It looks like it's there. That, oh, it, it looks like it's, it's there. Mirage-like nature is a good pointer. And it's just crazy because when you actually experience impermanence, which is you're, you're experiencing it now, you're just not, I, I don't know how to describe it, but you're, 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 like you said, your concepts are freezing it apparently in a reflective thought. So somehow you have this 
binding moment of consciousness where it's like this is a thing and mm -hmm. it's here but when you really when you really just look at it and you see that it there's nothing stable in experience it's just this beautiful radically ephemeral empty effervescent i mean the words don't do it justice it's a kind of a an awe inspiring experience yeah the and this it goes back to the pragmatic utility of this again Okay, from a suffering standpoint, mm -hmm. right? So what are we trying to do? Well, we have these experiences, they feel overwhelming. It's like, I'm trying to get beyond it. I'm trying to let go of it. I'm trying to on and on and on. And then, as they say, in, again, in, in, the, in the Tibetan tradition, phenomena self-release upon mm -hmm. arising. Mm -hmm. So the moment this thought is gone in its arising, it's gone. We don't have to do anything about your thinking. Reality, reality is the great, I say the great master of all those things we've been taught are the things to practice, you know, the things that we've been taught to get better at, letting go of things, for mm. example, accepting things. You hear psychologists talk about it, you hear spiritual people talk about it. And it's like, let's look at the way reality is because reality is the master of that. Those, are, those aren't really prescriptions, even though we hear them as such. They are descriptions from my standpoint mm. of the way life is. Yeah. Life lets go of itself in each instant, naturally, effortlessly, and you don't need to do a damn thing to help it let go. It's letting go whether you want it to let go or not. It's, you could say, accepting what is without condition because it is what is. So it's not even acceptance. It's like the ocean, the ocean's not accepting the waves. It is the waves, right? right? So again, them, yeah. like I'm gonna practice I'm gonna become such a good meditator. I'm gonna be so good with my mindfulness that I'm gonna cultivate greater acceptance. I mean, it's actually, this may sound really dismissive of the meditative uh, path as it's often taught, but I'm just gonna be truthful. And that is, it's a game. There's not even, the acceptance thing is is a game in this sense, which is, if this is as radically transient and non-durational and impermanent as we were just discussing. What's to accept? <laughs> whatever you think you've yeah. accepted is already, it's gone. already gone. Or that you're trying to accept. Right. I'm trying to accept this feeling. You know, I, I heard this lecture about accepting and not judging my experience. So now I'm going to be more accepting of my, what are you talking about? It's like, it's not here anymore to accept. So it's. You're still kind of up in conceptual world moving icons. Exactly. Now, now again, because I think in many ways, like for me, that kind of striving conceptual fooling around, I did for quite some time. Mm -hmm. And it was helpful in the sense that it showed me that first of all, I wasn't good at it. Mm -hmm. I've, I've, I felt it might be futile for me. Some people mm -hmm. are more like avatars of that. They can really kind of mm -hmm. do that, but, but I couldn't, but it did give me a good sense in moments of insight because you're forced to kind of sit and try to concentrate whether it's breath or whatever, and mm -hmm. then accept things as they come. But then right. you do, kind of radically by default start to see what is the breath? Mm -hmm. Like, what is this thing that I've been told right. to, to look at? Like, oh my gosh, it's radiant, completely impermanent, coming out of nothing, going into nothing, mm -hmm. happening to no one, by the right. way. Like I can't find a self right. experiencing this. And that's just in my experience. Right. And I think that that kind of practice, and I, I get the sense you're suggesting this, and I, I agree if, 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 you me if you meant this, that, that that style of like, you know, allowing your experience to be as it is, aka accepting it as it is, rather than sort of struggling with it. There's different reasons why that can be powerful. Mm. But one is that it takes us out of this uh, sort of condition, whatever, habitual tendency, again, to try to micromanage it, mm. where we're, we're sort of already assuming it's a problem to be micromanaged. <laughs> so that kind of draws us the effort to try to control experience sort of takes us back into that conceptual frame of reference. That this is Whereas a problem the allowing can, yeah. can start to open us up uh -huh. in, a, in a certain way to, uh -huh. wow, first of all, you can start to discover that what you imagine was threatening, problematic, when you when you just allow so much of experience to, to in other words, you're not you're sort of dropping the rope of struggle with it. You're just like, mm. you're, right? You're just letting go of the fight with it. And there it just is. And that can start to reveal some of what you were like you were suggesting mm. in terms of its uh, transcendental, you know, radiant nature. The, the, because you're not so busy trying to change it and transform yeah, it you did into a, something you think is better. You did a, you did a, a practice called drifting, the drifting nature of reality, and 
This was- That's one of my favorites. Of it really is remarkable because what, what you're pointing at, and you can correct me where I'm wrong and I am wrong everywhere, but the, the, the is, is, hey, so much of meditative practice is, hey, shoehorn your attention, whatever that is. I still don't know what attention is. And we can talk about that too, because I'm good, curious. That's good, I don't know what it is either. Okay, good, as long yeah. as we're in agreement, yeah. because <laughs> this attention feels like either it's a beam coming from a self, which is seems a construct of the concept, or it's just an object, attention becomes an object. In other words, the object be, springs into life and it, it just is, mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's attention. That's how I experience attention, doing the practice that you said, which is a non-doing. It's just mm -hmm. allowing experience to drift. You're not trying to control anything and know that the nature of reality is to drift. It just is, if it's that's impermanent. A, that's its instability that we we're talking about. That's right. right. It's, it, if it's nature, right, is to not hold still. It's not to be stable, which, which is, I mean, it's so beneficial to see that, um, especially when we're making often such great efforts, even just in a conventional sort of non-spiritual seeker sense mm. to try to create stability, to try to create uh, predictability and controllability of phenomena so that I can be okay. Right. It always comes back to, am I gonna be okay? Fear, yeah. That's like the, yeah. that's like almost the default. It's like, why am I worried about this? Because I might not be okay. Right. <laughs> why, why, why am I worrying about the future? Because I may not be okay. Um, what's potentially an issue with what's here right now because where might it, it might lead me to a place of not being okay. Mm. Um, and, but to see that my efforts to find something stable, like wouldn't we want a sense of well being that has some kind of ground stability to it that's not just absolutely just vanishing, you know, every second? We, I would, I understand that we would want that, something that you could count on, right? Rely on. But we're just not going to find it. We're, we're looking for stability in that which is not stable, which is reality. So you're not going to find it. You're not going to stabilize anything, which turns out paradoxically to be the real stability. The real stability. That's that the does, real the real ground, right? The most ground. The real it's ground the, is that there's no ground. It's a groundless ground. It is. Right. It's just, you can't find the bottom. And that could feel like terrifying if you're wanting there to be a bottom, right. hoping there's a bottom, believing there's a bottom, right. a, a finality, a final conclusion of oh, here is what it is, or here's the explanation. There's my ground, you know, I, I feel I feel like I've got ground underneath me, but but actually you don't. Just, just feel what's here and you feel, you don't hit bottom, but why that's such a powerful ground in a, in a way is because it's what's actual. Mm. It's what you can actually count on, which makes it the ground. You can actually rely on the fact that this, has no bottom to it in the sense of being able to pin it down, determine what it is, conclude what it is. That's the groundless nature of it. It's just absolutely won't be found. The ground won't be found. And in some sense, I wonder, you know, because, and then I'm just gonna speculate here. I think that the conceptual mind that we humans are pretty good at, that we've conditioned since birth and probably is part of our genetics. It's just like kind of how our mind system reflects. So if you take, you know, sight, sound, touch, taste, um, smell, the kind, those kind of sense gates, but then you have consciousness, mm -hmm. which is the kind of thought gate. And mm -hmm. it seems like in humans, that thought gate has a pattern generator, whatever it is, the supercomputer that mm -hmm. suddenly creates this thing. And it's driven by an operating system that's must that 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 it, survival is the prime directive. So this, I, I, am I going to be okay? Right. Is the prime directive of this mind system in the conventional sense mm -hmm. in this conceptual realm, and that sense of groundless ground, mm -hmm. seen from the lens of the conventional, is terrifying. Can mm -hmm. be terrifying. Sure. Can be an existential crisis. Yeah. But seen from the perspective of of just pure being of actually experiencing, right. it's it's radically infinitely right. free. Right. And because it, it whatever you thought it was, you don't like the weather, wait five minutes, what weather? Like it's just, it's just this <laughs> happening and happening and happening. And one, one of the interesting experiences that I've had in my own practices, um, and again, it, it comes down for me because my mind is so, so conceptually oriented and mm -hmm. so conditioned that it does take some sitting silently for some hours mm -hmm. before uh, something will relax, apparently, seemingly relax, where I can now really experience- Do you thought. feel that that's still true for you? Um, you know what's interesting? It's less true, uh -huh. but I'll say this. Like, for example, if I get off my regimen of like trying to meditate, you know, whatever I can do, mm -hmm. just the just sitting there meditation and mm -hmm. allowing, 
it, I find myself much more trapped in concept and concrete worldview like I had before I went down this path or seemingly. Mm -hmm. And when I do at least maybe an hour, and then if I do three hours, mm -hmm. if I do five hours, like mm -hmm. on the out and the outlier end, yeah. what will happen is I can experience without trying, I drop into experiencing body as radiant mm -hmm. energy, totally impermanent, coming out of nothing and going into nothing. And actually that radical emptiness of the body, I experience it as, as the base of reality. And there's a simultaneous mind that arises that is terrified of that and a simultaneous sense, <laughs> like a deeper sense that's like, <sighs> what an amazing freedom that this is what we are. But let me, let me, if I could follow up, um, just to push you a little bit. So we, we've talked about several different things. We explored several things around like the unbounded nature of this, the boundaryless nature of this, the radical impermanent nature of this. You, you don't, you see that quite clearly, don't you right now? And you're, you didn't meditate for five hours before our conversation. So that that's what I mean by, it's like this stuff, this shit's staring us in the face. It's like, do you really actually have to meditate for five hours for mm. it to come into view? Mm. Or is it what you are actually viewing right mm. now? It's what you're experiencing right now. You're not experiencing like, does that make sense what I'm, what I'm yeah, asking? Yeah, it does. Like, you're, like but, your experience right now is where, where, are you, where are, in other words, meditating for five hours I'm not picking on meditation, by the way. No, you, no, no. You, but just to it's say- worth, It's worth uh, yeah, diving into Yeah, it's just something to consider that. Yeah. Yeah. that you see it is that way. Like reality is that way. And it's that way right now. Just look. Right. Just look. Just look now. Don't, don't wait. Don't wait till somehow the mind's quieted down enough in order to see it. You are seeing it right now. And it doesn't matter what the mind's saying. It's like- the feeling of this moment, just feel how it has absolutely no continuity, right? There's no duration. Boom, it's gone. There you, there you, that's it. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Right? Yeah. But then I would ask, I would ask this, I'll throw this back at you. Okay, so cool. <laughs> you're an amazing teacher and an adept at this. You're pointing at it right now. And so I see it. It's almost like you're, you're pointing to my nose and saying, there, there it is. Yeah, just, just, just but, having you have a look. You know, so now what if here. I didn't have you here in my studio? How would I, what, how, is this where your practices are actually teaching mm. people to do this on their own? Like how do the people see this? I sure hope so. Yeah. I mean, I certainly. To Without me, hours of meditation. Yeah. But, and I mean, to me. Uh, somebody that's functioning as some sort of whatever mentor in in these areas, as as I I guess I am. Um, you teach students about this. Yeah, 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 yeah for mm -hmm. sure. In, in human beings that are interested in and curious find their way to me, and we explore this stuff together. Um, are you going to charge setting. me for this session? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, no, I'm getting no. a lot out of it. Yeah, yeah. Well, good. Um, you know, it's. Uh, it's like the last thing in the world with one exploring this stuff would be to, to develop any sort of idea that it somehow depends upon mm -hmm. the presence of that that mentor, that teacher, whatever. Mm -hmm. That's just absolutely not true. It's like, and the teacher, in my view, should really be highlighting the tr the reality of that, that the, the truth that this is like your experience. Mm. That's the teacher. Yeah, your experience. And, and if I am able to direct you back in a certain way to look at your experience, for one to look at their experience, just outside of the familiar frames of reference that they believe it to be based on, you know, mm. just years and years and years of habitually imagining, like even these simple, not so simple things like the, the instability of the radical instability of this, it's like, okay, just look, let's look together. Mm. And then, yeah, I mean, is it helpful to hear that, be reminded of that as part of the upending of the age-old habit of reorienting to, what are you talking about? This is stable. It's like things are holding still. It's like this moment mm -hmm. is, here I am again in my my crappy life, you know, my dull, boring, mundane life. It's like, yeah, I mean, those, those interpretations are running. They have a kind of momentum, right? Mm -hmm. And so somebody who's teaching this kind of stuff that I'm sharing can – can just function as a kind of a disruptor of that momentum, mm -hmm. such that you know redirect you to to like look at it in another way, to see what's here again from this other perspective, this experiential mm -hmm. perspective. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, it's like 
I mean, the point is to 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 live that, to to just see that that is increasingly. I mean, you you know, you know, you have the you you already have so much deep understanding of this is so obvious that you know at some point you come to just trust that in a mm, way where yeah. you don't necessarily you might enjoy hearing the reminders you know and then in a way i mean i never tire of hearing them in a certain way hearing them from others or hearing myself speak them in some ways because there's something so beautiful about how fathomless this is mm. and and it's just oh my god it's just i mean it's it's sensual beyond sensual you know mm. how rich this is how juicy it is how luscious it is and we're fe- that's what we're feeling actually and when we're sort of dumbing it down by the interpretations we don't realize how shockingly rich this is so yes so somebody just like saying what i just said might cause us for a moment to stop and consider let me look at what's actually here. Let me feel what's here. And then, you know, that can just be kind of a prompt to then and, look again. And I think that's the big value of, of teachings like this is they are that pointer. It's mm-hmm. like a tra- you know transmitting pointer. Like, oh, yeah, oh, oh, there it is. It's right here in my experience. And I didn't see it. Like when you walk me through that just then, like, well, look now, look now. Right. Well, do you see it now? Right. So what it is, yeah, I, um, uh, what, what, there was something I was going to say about that, but uh, the- um, Can I say something about oh, transmission? Yeah, and please, maybe please. come back to you. Please, yeah. It came up in my discussion with Sam, you may recall, but somehow we're talking about the value of the teacher, the potential sort of downsides of relying on the teacher, becoming dependent on the teacher. Right. And I said like these concepts and some of the spiritual traditions of like spiritual transmission, like the teacher is somehow downloading oh, something right. to me. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which is really big. You know? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's big. It's big. People believe that. Yeah. People, people believe that. They have some sense of that's what's happening. And it isn't that something's not maybe being catalyzed, that somehow- what you're calling the teacher is out there, out separate from you is catalyzing. But actually, of course, you only know the teacher as your experience. So in a right. sense, it's you. It's you. It's you. You're the, you're, you're it. Life is the teacher. You're the teacher. It's a, you told you said Absolutely. that to Sam and I remember something clicked in my head. I was like- I think I said something about how this idea of the transmission of the primordial right, right, right. divine energy of Dharma, life right, yeah. is, that's what you're getting. That's what we're getting right now is a straight- download the straight transmission yeah. of reality of of the absolute pure purest of the pure is is like this is what we're partaking of it's being transmitted it, that experience is transmitting everything <laughs> that we ever wanted moment by moment and so there is their transmission it's like the teacher is they're just they, an, maybe maybe they can help one to recognize that potentially right but what you want to be seeing is that the transmission is every moment. It's not the moments with the teacher. You come out of the retreat and you you step foot out of the re- retreat center. And you, that first step out of the retreat center is the transmission of reality. And then as you walk to the car, it's the transmission of reality. And you sit in the car and you turn the car on and every single part of it, right? That's the holographic nature I was saying. Like every piece is the whole. Every phenomena is the doorway into the same astonishing, inconceivable, unresolvable presence. It, it, everything is a doorway into that. And that's just, that's the good news. That's, that's the good great. News. It's great. That's news. the great yeah, good great news, news that yeah. that every experience is your perfect, my perfect doorway into what this is. It's like every experience, it's almost like here, here, reality goes in here. Here I am as this. Here I am as this. Here I am as this. You know, I was uh, I did an interview with Andrew Holacek. Mm, I don't know that name. So he's um, he's another guy who's like uh, friends with uh, Ken Wilber, and and uh-huh. he is a dream yoga more in the Tibet, Tibetan tradition. So mm-hmm. he does a lot of sleep yoga, dream yoga type stuff, but very very much a non dual pointer. And he talks about the dreamlike quality of of waking life. Mm -hmm. And when you start to focus and recognize that, you can actually more easily lucid dream. So one of his interests Mm. is lucid dreaming Uh as a practice. And then also the deeper yogas and things of sleep Mm -hmm. to kind of get in touch with whatever clear light mind and pure being and Uh those kind of things. And one of the things that he uh, has you do in the waking state is to close eyes and do reverse blinking. So you're blinking like this, just like short little bursts and seeing reality in this just a flash. Mm-hmm. And 
the first time I did that as a practice, he's like, just try that and notice how reality mm. pops in and pops out before you even know what's happening mm -hmm. and how that feels discontinuous. Like many dreams, they feel mm -hmm. suddenly you're in a- Right, and catapulted in some other world, like in, in a nanosecond. In a nanosecond. Yeah. Yeah. And I did it for the first time uh, while I was sitting and it was it was such a profound effect of impermanence, mm -hmm. that that experience, that I started getting a fear response, like a profound, like destate, like, de right, wow, right. reality really is completely ungraspable. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, it's, it's truly, un, you know, happening and happening and happening. And then you open your eye and you can see that, this is, it's just coming into and out of being, but that's okay. In fact, it's better than okay. Mm -hmm. It's how everything is. And, you know, luckily for us getting across the street or doing whatever, we're able to, mm -hmm. we have the conceptual mind to put it in this sort of interface. Right. But the fact that we confuse our interface for reality and think it's the only thing is the root of so much suffering. I, without question, without question. You know, one of the things that you point out that I thought was different than a lot of teachers mm -hmm was the inconceivability of experience, meaning it's not something you can put into concepts and put into words. You can only experience it and realize it's radically impossible to describe. Right. And it goes deeper and deeper and deeper. And it made me think about a couple practical things. Mm. One is the difference between a Zoom interview mm -hmm. and an in-person interview. Mm. Now, mm. it's almost like Zoom is a conceptualization of in person at some level, it's an abstraction mm -hmm. of, now in reality, it's still the same living experience. Like right. we're seeing images, we're hearing, yeah. some, those, those are, but but it's almost like one abstraction out from a normal human relationship, as mm -hmm. opposed to this, which has a bandwidth that's infinite. Mm -hmm. Like we're looking at each other, I can see very subtle, indescribable mm -hmm. body language. Yep. There's even an energetic sense of like something's happening. Mm -hmm. There's no separation mm -hmm. between us. Mm -hmm. And it's so it's such a different sense that even in a practical application within our conceptual model, it has they have different outcomes, mm -hmm. you know, in terms of connection, yeah. communication, productivity. Yeah. I mean, I having been in my teaching work, you know, on Zoom during the pandemic for like two years or whatever, teaching on Zoom. Uh, it was it was amazing coming back in person with these people that I've been interacting with in this virtual space of Zoom for two years, and feel how it was like someone like dosed me with LSD. Like mm. it was like suddenly to be with them in like in the three dimensional, mm. you know, one way I could describe it. It was like I don't know. It was like, um, it's certainly my preference. Yeah, a depth of experience. Something something about it that's like, I can't really say, but um, although I was surprised at how, at the same time that I'm saying that, of how much seemed to be happening over Zoom. I mean, I do these weekly Zoom meetings on Sunday mornings. I started early on in the pandemic where I mean, that was really where I started to share more about this more, even though mm. I've been writing books for years about it. Right. I was just sort of hiding out, not really hiding out, but just not being terribly out right. <laughs> in terms of talking about this or creating opportunities to talk about it. Um, but in some ways, it started before COVID where I kind of did my led my first sort of in-person retreat and then COVID mm. hit like two months later. Mm. And I was like, I just had this impetus to, you know, to share about it because I just, I love to speak about it. It's just so- It can be very powerful by Zoom, actually. Yeah, and that's what I have found. Yeah. You know, I'm still doing these weekly Zoom meetings. Um, they can find you through the I, website. You know, for yeah. the last two years. And yeah. Uh, yeah, I have info on the website about them. If anyone's interested, you're, anyone's welcome to join. And yeah, it's, it's, a, it's a, like a lot happens in Zoom that's incredibly rich. And mm -hmm. I don't know, in some ways it's, now, what would it be like to be in person with the people who are joining in the Zoom? I'm sure it'd be wonderful, but but it's but it's different, right? And and the Zoom allows you. Like I've seen, you I've know, got people from you know lots of people from Europe participating. Europe, it's that's wonderful, right. right? Angela does the same thing, and these you, you'll see all the squares, and then the teachings are still incredibly powerful, mm -hmm. and the and the connection with the sangha or the group of people. Mm -hmm. There's something there that you can't. Yeah. I used to think that was all woo woo nonsense until I did an actual sitting retreat with 30 other, you know, people from mm. my group. And, and it was, it's just, there's an energy there that's very different. Mm. And again, you don't like, I think what you're pointing at is you don't have to kill yourself sitting in meditation for hours and hours and hours and hours and hours to see reality. No, no. I mean, I, 
if I were to say, you know, one way to understand like the purpose of meditation from my standpoint is just to realize that, well, two things I would say. One is we've been discussing, you know, what are phenomena, right? Mm. So here's a really good meditation mm. is to discover what is meditation. Aha, that's interesting. What is, there you are, you're sitting on a cushion. What is that? <laughs> You have a name for it. It's called meditation. <laughs> what is it? What's actually there? That's great. Because it's the same thing as what's here right now. Right. You see, that's why I would say yeah. something like meditation's not necessary formal yeah. meditation because the exploration of what's here is, um, it's just available. It's not dependent on any particular circumstances or special postures or right. it's just right here. What's right this? Here. What, what, what's, what's here? I have all these names for it, but, but what's actually here? So same with meditation. What is meditation? Well, meditation is the transcendent mystery of reality yeah. that looks like meditation. But it's no, to, 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 for me, the, the key, really, key thing to discover around when you talk about something like freedom or liberation is that our language, our descriptors have strongly suggest imply um hierarchies mm -hmm. right of hierarchies of benefit hierarchies of value hierarchies of meaningfulness mm. hierarchies of beauty right that this is right this is more this is more beneficial than that right right and um but this other perspective that finds sort of the what is common to all experience, its presence, its indescribability, its unresolvability, um, different ways to say that, its, its instability. Mm. That's what com it's common about everything, mm. no matter from the most blissful moment to the most painful moment. Mm. So there's a hierarchy there descriptively, right? Like I prefer the blissful moments than the painful ones. We all do for the most part. <laughs> um, so that's the hierarchy. Mm. But then this discovery of what's common to all experience, let's take its instability, because we were talking about that, exploring that. Wow, it's like they're equally unstable, mm. the, the, the deepest pain and the deepest joy. They're equally unstable. They're e and because of that, they're equally ungraspable. Mm -hmm. And so that's why I say each of them is a doorway into the same thing. Mm. And therein lies the, um, the transcendence of the hierarchy. Hmm. of this is better than that, or this is right, this is more beneficial than that. It's like, what hierarchy? Yeah, Everything is of equal value. You could say equal significance, hmm. equal beauty. <laughs> I guess the Tibetans say one taste. Exactly, that's the one taste. Yeah, of one everything. taste. Of course, chocolate tastes entirely different from vanilla. Right. What do you mean one taste? There's two tastes there. Right, right, Very right. Very distinct. Right. Recognizably distinct, right? right? Discernible. You know it, clearly. discernible, yeah. clearly discernible. Mm -hmm. What is this one taste thing? Well- it's not found in the description. It's found by looking at what chocolate is. Mm. What is the taste of chocolate? And you'll immediately be thrust into the unknown. You have no idea what the taste of chocolate is, and yet you can recognize it. Mm. Now, is that a paradox or what? Yeah. You can absolutely, like, eyes closed, someone sticks chocolate in your mouth, chocolate, boom. Supercomputer knows exactly what it is. Okay, cool. What is the taste of chocolate? What's the taste of chocolate made of? <laughs> oh my God, I'm down the rabbit hole of infinity. I have no fucking clue mm -hmm. what the taste of chocolate is. Turns out that's the same thing with vanilla. I end up, they're both empty of describability, empty of identity, right? Different ways to say the same yeah, thing, right? Yeah, yeah. So that's of course wondrous and illuminating and transformatively liberating because we're liber liberated from the, the seeming, language's seeming implications of hierarchy. Mm, right, that mm -hmm. this is better than that. Yeah, and that, and and isn't that the this nature? This is freer than that. That's the nature of desire and aversion that are the roots of so much suffering. Is this hierarchy of, well, this is more wantable and this is less wantable. Pain, pleasure, it's based wholly on descriptions, on descriptions, on concept, on conceptualizations. You don't. You you have an aversion to the worry. Let's say that we were talking about. Mm -hmm. But that's based on how you're describing infinity, which isn't actually describable. <laughs> so when you see that, it's like version, attraction. It's like, 
Yeah. What, what are you talking about? What are you even looking at? <laughs> there's, there's not even something there yeah. that's, that you can actually find. Uh, I mean, I, and yet what, what's so, what's so just continues to just blow my mind is how this that transcends definition and description and findability and stability and continuity. And in that sense, we could say is nothing mm. findable or graspable, just right, just completely bottomless shows up as all of this. That, you know, the, the, it's like you get to have both. It's pretty effing amazing. Like I can drink yeah. and enjoy water. Yep. At the same time, I can't find water. I don't know what water is. I get both realities, right? How fun is that? <laughs> yep. The conventional and the absolute, the relative. Right. They're, one, they're one thing. They're one thing. Two different perspectives on the same thing. Right. For emptiness, dancing is form. Form is emptiness. Indeed. Same exact thing. And those are wonky terms, but they're pointing right at the same thing. Yeah. Essentially, that's what we're, we're, what we're exploring. So, so I, I want to ask you a wonky question yeah. because you, you brought this up with Sam and it had me thinking because I know Angela has talked about this too. This idea that consciousness is some primal knowing mm. quality of reality, like reality is consciousness mm -hmm. as a knowing mm -hmm field and you pointed at this and i felt this myself what the hell does that mean what is what is what do you mean by that mm -hmm. when you say consciousness what even is that like is that a thing mm -hmm. or is it yet that these ra these radiant phenomena happen and just their existence is the knowing of them like mm -hmm. they're not two right yeah i mean obviously consciousness or awareness is something that's highlighted in so many of the contemplative traditions and emphasized right and and in the scientific to, traditions, how is consciousness right. arising from sure. the mind? Right, absolutely. Yeah. What is the sentience? Right. Um, I think that, uh, what can I say about that? <laughs> uh, <laughs> it may be in ineffable. It certainly is. But um, it's almost like my one of my favorite words to describe reality is this. It, you know, because there's no real associations with that. You know, I could call it divinity, but then there's all these like metaphysical potentially associations that people will sort of pull into this. Oh, is this related to my faith tradition? It's like this, right? There's no baggage there, right? Yeah, just so this, this, just this, this. yeah. Just this. Mm -hmm. What's, what's up here, what seems That's to be my here? favorite too, actually. I oh. just kind of came to that. I'm like, it's just this. <laughs> you know, when you have those, you're just, well, what else? It's just this. And that sounds sounds ridiculous right. to the conceptual mind because yeah, of course it's just this. No, 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 you don't get it. It's just this. Right. Like that is radical. Like right. beyond description. Right. And yeah. it's just um I can't even remember the thread that we were on because Oh, we were talking about consciousness. About consciousness. Yeah, yeah, Thank yeah. you. Yeah, yeah. That thread. Um I lost consciousness of it. <laughs> apparently. J just this way. Yeah. Now it's back. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Um so this. So so this is beyond qualities and characteristics, at least that are findable and, and you know, right as mm -hmm. determinable as mm -hmm. we've been discussing. But it can be sort of as a one way. One way to talk about this uh, this is that it it seems to always show up as something. In other words, it's not just some bland, neutral, like blank nothingness. Mm. It's a nothingness that's just so, it's just rich. It's rich of all of this, right? Whatever this, even though this is not graspable or findable. So one thing I could say is that let's, let's say that this is like a jewel and the jewel has different facets, just like a, an actual gemstone, different facets to it. You could say sort of primordial facets. I mean, this is way too much conceptualizing about mm. it. Probably mm. I'm on treacherous territory to be even going here with it. But I would say that we could say one of the one of the facets of the jewel of this, the jewel of reality, is its um, its wakeful nature. Mm. It's like this. The, the wakefulness, the mm. sentience is woven into the very it's fabric of this. It is this. Inherent. It's inherent in it. In it. Say, right? It's mere. So there is no this without the wakefulness. That's right. right? They're so one we could in the talk, same. They're one in the same thing. That's right. So we could describe, we could talk about the wakefulness of this as like 
one of its featured, you know, aspects or ways that we can understand what's most primal about this, what's most to the bone of this. Right. If even though we can't ultimately get to the bone, right. because we could take that that uh, signifier, that word of wakefulness or consciousness, and of course, ask the same question. I keep inviting people to ask, which is, well, what is consciousness? Right. And then you come right back to the unresolvable. Right. You don't know what consciousness is, right? So that's the consciousness facet. But I will I will often talk about other facets of this. Like for example, um, we could talk about the the one of its facets is its indescribability, mm -hmm. right? It's inconceivability. So that's like another facet that's sort of primal of about this about reality about itself. Reality. About another phenomena. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Another facet of the jewel that is what everything shares in a sense is its presence. Everything is so in a sense all there is is presence. So I could say all there is is wakefulness. All there is is the knowing, just the knowing. What else is there? There's just knowing, the knowing of what is. There's nothing else. But I could also I could also highlight the facet of presence, like because it's like it brings forth another sort of dimension of it or an aspect of it, which is its hereness, its Now actual, it's it's yeah, its actual palpable. Because of course the the wakefulness is present and the presence mm. is wakefulness, mm. so it's like they're both they're 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 synonyms for each other on the one hand, mm. but they're sort of sort of highlighting different different, different facets. valences of different, it. Exactly. Different. Does that make sense? It it does. Yeah. In fact, it it doesn't. Make, and it's not even the conceptual sense is there, but the experiential sense of presence as a mm -hmm. aspect of reality. So the radiant nature, like even with my eyes closed, I see a scintillating mm -hmm. display of impermanent phenomenon that are right. only here and only now. And that is, it feels like presence. Mm -hmm. And dr and just dropping out of the conceptual mind apparently into just feeling that presence is a kind of peace in itself. Yeah. Almost like the, the, and it's a presence that, unlike our ordinary notions of presence being some state, mm that I can practice cultivating, right. get myself into, and then of course, lose. Lose, right. right. I'm not very present. Exactly. Yeah. Then I'm gonna find my way back to it somehow right. through various right. strategies. That's one version, but then there's this presence. <laughs> and this is the presence of what is. And of course that never goes anywhere. It doesn't go anywhere. Because it's always going in a sense of disappearing, disappearing, disappearing. Yeah. But paradoxically always remains, always remains, always remains. So which is it? Is it coming or going? It's both and neither. Yeah, and neither. It transcends any way that we might hold it conceptually. That's the key. Okay, few, so a few things. So yeah. I, want, I want to run by a, and tell me if you're tired because we've been going for about two hours now. <laughs> so at any point we may just call the code as we say in medicine. Yeah, right, right, exactly. Go, go eat dinner. The patient uh, right. yeah, is he's dead, Jim. That's right. Yeah. <laughs> we may be revived in the morning. We, we, hopefully, yeah. yeah. We've we basically chokeholded reality into submission. At right. this point, it's like I'm whatever you want, man. I'm whatever you want. Um, Angelo, kind of in his book, saying with the caveat that you can't describe reality this way. But mm -hmm. here's one conceptual model that I thought was interesting. He said, "Imagine there's a hallway, mm -hmm. and you're walking down the hallway, and as you walk, the lights that were lit on you go out." behind you. So it's black behind you and mm -hmm. it's black in front of you. So there's really nothing you can see in the hallway in front of you. And right. only where you stand this moment is illuminated by lights. Right. Now, take away you, mm -hmm. <laughs> take away lights, mm -hmm. and just what is lit is just happening and happening and happening and changing and changing and impermanent, happening, happening, flickering, flickering, impermanent. It, 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 it's such a fast way mm -hmm. that if you thought there was a self there, you could imagine it's moving through time as reality changes in this way. Mm -hmm. But in reality, it's just impermanent phenomenon, blinking self-aware, meaning that, that quality of the facet where it's just luminously aware of itself mm -hmm. and quite present, and that's reality. Right. But we think it's this hall, with these right. lights and this person, and that's passage how the mind, time. passage yeah. of time. I mean, what what's so, what, and of course, you know, you have a clear sense of this, obviously, that we, we could utilize, and, and I've been using different frames, you know, trying to put different frames on this as a way of trying to characterize what can't be characterized. Can't be characterized, But yeah. it's valuable to keep pointing that out, to say that, you know, is it, like, is it something that's lasting? Is it just a flickering on and off? It's like 
come back to the question, what's here? Mm. Mm. <laughs> what's here in this instant? And I, you can't say, is it holding still? Is it moving? Is it flickering? Is it just, you know, you really can't, there's just no, right? It's just, it just belies any, any efforts that we might make to, uh, to put it into some, you know, it's a, you can't put infinity into a finite box. It would appear. And, and yet, and, and yet and it yet, seems to be finite, Yeah, yeah. but it never really becomes finite. We, you know, we were talking about this before the show. It's probably a good way to kind of wrap this episode up because mm -hmm. we've talked about so much um, that we need to do another episode to talk about all the other things we didn't talk about. Uh, <laughs> That'll be fun. <laughs> that will be fun. Yeah. I want to talk about, because one of the things I want to make sure we do in a future episode is the fact that both of you and you and I are kind of integral alt middle viewpoint, meaning um, when you see that there's no inherent <laughs> nature of things in that sense that they don't have an inherent essence. Mm -hmm. As you start to extrapolate into the conceptual world, you start to realize that all views are kind of partial. Partialized. Partialized, partialized perspectives. Yeah. And so when we're in a world where we think everything's black and white, where I'm good and you're evil, where you're all about trust your feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, there's one great untruth of Jonathan Haidt's, uh, mm -hmm. trust your feelings, emotional reasoning, like right. these emotions are real. Right. Are they? What is that? What is that emotion that you feel? Right, right. Uh, yeah. um, that could be a great idea and a, just a horrendous idea. So it depends on the circumstances, we could say, the the, the details, right? All you the know? details of the relative. Right. So yeah, I mean, that oversimplification of our points of view can lead us to not really consider looking more deeply, to not consider the diversity of viewpoints that can be brought to bear upon us, a particular phenomenon that's occurring, let's say, personally or socially or right world globally and uh, yeah i think i think that that tendency to hold the points of view in a more kind of rigid dogmatic rigid. way we're very identified with them i mean human beings will kill each other over, oh. over points of view right we love to do that like really they're wow. doing it now yeah right or if someone challenges your point of view you know it could feel very threatening it's like a why because we've invested Right, we, we've got a, it seems like there's a lot of, of stake, right? It. Yeah, a lot of stake, yeah. And so when you realize that they're just, there's this great term that they use in, in some of the mindfulness kind of psychology, that rapprochement between those two, those worlds that, you know, the, the, the way to really diffuse from, from the fusion with thought is to see that the thinking, that the interpreting thoughts are, are not facts, they're just thoughts. Mm-hmm. And wow, you know, just seeing that one thing, you know, that the interpretation that the thoughts are interpretations of reality rather than being equal to reality. So then there you are in, in, in some conflict with your partner or trying to negotiate some complex, you know, social problem you've conceived as a social problem. You're trying to figure out how to address this, right? And it's like just to realize that your ideologies, your all the doctrines that you're bringing to bear upon that you know, are, they're, they're going to be oversimplified. They're going to be partial and there's probably going to be value in having those expanded, refined, challenged, opened up, challenged, dialogued, dialogued, yeah. right. Mm -hmm. And yeah. Yeah. And, and we, and we see that, you know, I don't know, it seems like it's gone by the wayside in some ways. Oh our, yeah. No, it's gotten, it's gotten, you know what? I'll say this. Uh, Ian McGilchrist, um, guy who writes a lot about left and right brain, psychiatrist uh -huh. in Great Britain, philosopher, wrote a book called Master and His Emissary about mm. the the real differences between right and left brain. Mm. And the way he categorizes it is, he, is, and he's, I think he feels a lot like us in the sense that no reality is actually, in fact, he wrote a follow-up book called The Matter with Things, mm. saying, are there really things? Interesting. Yeah. It's mm. really just process of just radical impermanence. Wow. And and uh, he's a psychiatrist in Great Britain and he's mm. been on my friend David Fuller's show and he's a real real great thinker. Mm -hmm. He, the master in his atmosphere was talking about how we've gone from a right brain way of seeing things, which is more holistic, contextual, uh, relational, mm -hmm. um, kind of radically contextual. Like mm -hmm. everything is in its context. Everything is part of a thing, a mm -hmm. whole to the left brain side, which was the servant of the right brain. It kind of evolved as the way to conceptualize, to break a thing into parts mm. and then so on. And what's happened is we, 
the, the servant has taken over the role as usurped the master. Mm -hmm. And so we see society where we've broken down into mm -hmm. parts, into fra fractions, into a flatland kind of worldview of things. And mm -hmm. it happens as we get more bureaucratic, like medicine has become this bureaucracy, this tech, uh, this administrative technocracy of reductionistic mm -hmm. conceptualizing and assembly line thinking. Mm -hmm. Whereas you and I both know that a big part of healing is this, <laughs> it's like the seeing the radical right. intimacy of all of it. Mm -hmm. um, and and that, and that society has kind of gone in that direction mm -hmm. and to our to our peril, and it's mm -hmm. and he goes through historical societies that have kind of fallen as they got more left brain, mm -hmm. um, and I thought that was a rather interesting way mm -hmm. to look at it. And it gets back to the Jill Bolt Taylor thing, mm -hmm. you know, the stroke of insight. Right, she right. had a huge left brain stroke, right. and when she talks about it in her famous TED talk, mm -hmm. she you know, the way she talks about it is the way you're mm -hmm. kind of pointing at reality. It's this right. radius is a beam of light landed on me right. in the hospital. And it was just this indescribable, stunning. Yeah. stunning. Right. Like we're filtering it out all the time. And she even says, she's like, from a neuroscientist standpoint, yeah, it's all just streaming energy coming into the sense organs and some processing that makes a world. Mm -hmm. So how is that different than the, uh, the so-called spiritual realization, which is, it's all just streaming energy. <laughs> you know, that, that is, uh, um, or even beyond that, that we can't say what it is. Even beyond that, like, what is stream? What is energy? What is, what is energy? What does that even mean? That's a, con a that's concept a word. Question. Yeah. What is energy? It's a great word. <laughs> I don't know. It's something that we're going to run out of soon because we've been talking for so long. But man, <laughs> it's uh, it, it's it's great. And then um, the last thing I wanted to ask is: so how yeah. can people get started down the uh, John Aston rabbit hole? <laughs> uh, the rabbit hole of life. We've got the yeah, book, the, the here, life rabbit the hole, the life that, rabbit that, hole that I love to talk about. Um, you know, my my website is is has in a sense everything I've created. JohnAston.com. Yeah, John and you're Aston. a musician too. I am, and of all this like awesome like old school music pointing at reality. It's like it's like it's like musical. You call them musical pointing out instructions. Yeah, that's it's awesome. Fun. I've been writing music for years about the very thing we've been exploring. That's today, kind of this awesome. Evening. Um, yeah, my website's got everything there from my writings to my music to um, I've been putting up a lot of the videos from these Zoom meetings that I mentioned. Mm. They're just up on YouTube now, but you can access all those from my website. That's all just available for people's um, exploration. And and then I, um, for people that are interested in you know working individually with me to explore this in a kind of a context of one on one kind of tailoring it to what's up for them, what they find themselves exploring or bumping up against or feeling like might be points of confusion or perceived obstacles to understanding this more fully in their own experience, then people are welcome to reach out to me and I, I love meeting with people individually too, so. Awesome, and I'll, yeah. I'll, I'll, I'll put the, the links in the show notes, uh, John Ast johnaston.com, yeah, J-O-H-N-A-S-T-I-N.com. Yes. Yeah. And uh, dude, thanks for spending time hey, with me. It's it so great to talk with you. So I, much fun. Yeah, really, really a pleasure. Thank yeah, you. and we'll do it again and we'll get into the weeds even more. Maybe we'll do some direct uh, pointings and things like that. And I, I think it'll be fun no matter what we do. I love it. <laughs> so, All right, guys, you know what to do, thanks. share the show. Find John at all the things, and uh, I would say we are out, but we were never in because we're <laughs> radically impermanent, brother. <laughs> That's right. Exactly. So long, guys.